Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome back. Today's podcast is brought to you by Black Rifle Coffee, and you know how I do this. I go right to blackriflecoffee.com, and I talk to you about what I see. And right now what I'm looking at is their exclusive coffee subscription. And they have a bag coming that I don't even know how to pronounce. I think it's Anunnakai Gold. I don't really know. Evan comes up with some weird names for stuff, but I really like the fact that it's like a Mayan god wearing NVGs. That's pretty dope. And of course, you can start a regular coffee subscription. And then if you follow the banner over right now, they're doing 15% off of coffee bundles. You can scroll right down and look at every roast that they do from light to dark, decaf, everything in between. They have some new women's apparel. And then, of course, they have gear to make your coffee in because what good is coffee if you don't have a vessel to make it in? They have coffee bundles. They have coffee samplers. And then, of course, the bottom, the best seller. And I'm looking right at the Tacticock t-shirt. One of my favorites, impossible to keep in stock at the coffee shop. Go to BlackRifleCoffee.com. Go buy some amazing shit. My guest today is Earl Plumley. He's a master sergeant in the United States Army. He was awarded the Silver Star for his actions in Afghanistan that took place on the 28th of August in 2013. His Silver Star was then upgraded to the Medal of Honor and presented to him by Joe Biden on December 16th, 2021. I am going to let him tell the entire story. It is insane. What an amazing human being. Episode number 288 with Earl Plumley. Enjoy. Okay, I got the red smoke. Okay, copy. West of the smoke. I'm looking at danger close now. Oh, wait a minute. Give it to me. I need it. You're cleared hot. Copy, cleared hot. What's that ring you got on your finger there? I don't have one of those. I'm oh, you don't have... Bit. It's it's a, it's a ring from the Medal of Honor Society, and uh, it showed up in the mail about a month after I got the Medal of Honor. That would explain why I don't have one, yeah. just for clarity. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, uh, yeah, I was... Showed up just in time. I had a, a team ring that I, I uh, temporarily misplaced. Is what I'm telling my wife, but it's gone. So they. I had always heard that it's not the Congressional Medal of Honor. That it's just the Medal of Honor. I I've heard. Look it, at you just whipping that thing. Yeah, out. I was like, it's a, don't you know, wait, don't make point. me whip out my fucking Navy <laughs> Achievement Medal. Um, I don't so know if I've ever seen one. It's just the Medal of Honor. They call it the Congressional Medal of Honor because uh, Congress reviews that process yeah but they really don't have anything to say about it unless it's downgraded so uh, interesting and and the big thing for them is if it's downgraded they go in and dig into why and make sure that it was downgraded solely for the the merits of the valor not for uh any other reason what's the little is that like a lapel pin it's a lapel pin for a suit okay so you have so I don't know what camera angle you'd have to put this on, Michael, but so this would be the traditional military ribbon that you're going to wear in mm-hmm. like a, you'd wear it actually in a dress or a non-dress uniform. That one's your lapel pin. Very common to see SEALs wearing little tridents because God forbid not everybody know you're a SEAL. And then obviously that's the full medal itself. Yeah. When do you, so obviously the top ribbon is on a military uniform. When does the full ribbon need to be worn or when is it supposed to be worn? I think, uh. There's probably some protocol, yeah. Uh, but I, I'm I a, feel like you should know these protocols. I, yep, I should. Uh, <laughs> but the, the cool thing about having the Medal of Honor, you just you you can wear it whatever you want, and everybody just goes along with it. Um, so for me, yeah. I I, tr- I tend not to wear the full the ribbon. Uh, yeah, or the, I'm sorry, the what would you call it actually? I, I the full medal. The full medal. Okay. Uh, unless I'm in um, a dress uniform, uh, if I'm running around with the the guy, the guy, all the guys that are out and they're in suits. I'll throw it on, um, you know, full business dress. I'll put it on. Yeah, but that's my own take. Um, How does it change people's reaction to you? Everybody thinks I know where what I'm doing and where I'm going, and so people will let me uh, just walk off in the wrong direction because obviously I must have uh, full full situational awareness of what I'm doing. It's not a navigational medal. It's not a navigational sure. medal. No, actually, it's it's actually a beacon of I get in bad situations. So if you if you ever see me wearing it, you know, point me in the, the proper place to go because I'll find something weird to do. What percentage of recipients uh, receive it posthumously? Because I know it's the vast it's, majority. It's uh, it's sixty nine and a couple percent. So you, okay. seventy percent of the time, uh, you'll, you'll your family will, will be receiving it on your behalf. Yeah, it's almost uh, like hey, I was presented with an absolute worst case scenario, and I was courageous enough and fucking lucky enough to survive. Yeah, it's a it's a, it's a twofer, and you know that was. Our experience is, um, you know, none, none of my guys got killed for me to get mine. Another soldier was killed, Mike Aulis. But, you know, none of my inner circle. So when we, we went to the White House, we were kind of, 
we were charged up. Yeah. And then we met up with the, the two families that were, were going to go with us, and they were getting theirs posthumously, uh, the Cash and Sleese families. And that kind of, you know, it's it kind of a somber. For sure. Uh, to the occasion. How much did it change your life? I deployed uh, a couple weeks after I got it. So it didn't, it didn't uh, change my life at all um, until I left the operational side. And then instead of you know, doing a first sergeant position or a, uh, an op sergeant position, which would be the natural per- career progression, I, I do things like wear the medal and, and uh, decorate hallways. Do you enjoy doing that? Uh, not all the time, but uh, I get, a, I get a, a lot of uh, recruiting and retention work, and I, I enjoy that. Yeah. Like talking to, you know, 82nd Airborne Privates about why they should stay in or, you know, talking to kids that are on the fence about a service, and I, I like that. I think it's uh, the right time in my career for that. Yeah. Did they? Uh, so you deployed right after you received it. Did it put any operational restrictions upon you, or were you just treated like anybody else? It was in our risk assessment. <laughs> so. Yeah. By the way, hey, it's bad uh, press. This, you know, yeah, if something were to here. happen. Yeah, they. You know, they. Uh, it was a. It was a southern Philippines, not the safest place, but not necessarily yeah. the most. You know, it's not. Uh, it's not Afghanistan by any means. Um, you know, but it was just a planning consideration. Um, that we, we kind of worked around, you know, don't let this guy get killed. Yeah. It's generally a good but that, you know, philosophy and idea for don't, all planning per, considerations. Yeah, don't, don't let it, uh, anybody get killed. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, let, let, let's try not to let anybody get killed itself. Um, I've known a few Medal of Honor uh, recipients, and uh, it impacts them in very different ways. I would, yeah, I would, I would say for, from my observation – um, you got guys like me. I, I consider mine pretty cheap. Uh, it was, it's a cool gunfight. Sto- it's a cool gunfight story. Uh, even though everybody got shot, you know, we were all back at work the next day. Uh, I'll bet you know, limping around. And then you have the recipients where, um, they're, you know, horribly disfigured. Yeah. Um, and or all their friends got killed. So that I think that brings a, a different way and manner uh, that you wear the medal, and and you can see it. A lot of them just hate wearing it. Um, it's it's a and you can see that it's got some. It's different weight. The metal weighs um, differently for for each recipient, and that's uh you can read their narratives and almost see you know what what they're carrying yeah. around with them. There's not a ton of them in the uh, SEAL community, and <clears throat> I want to speak broadly um, because just out of respect for the individuals, but I've seen it ruin people's lives. I could see. Um, I, I think the guy, you know, I got mine as an E8, post-20, um, fairly uh, mature. And, you were already having a, a different military experience. Right. You, are, and, uh, you could see the light at the end of the tunnel. Right. And I can see, uh, <laughs> and I can see the, the guys that got it, and, I, and I've talked to them, um, when, they, when they get it as like an E4, E5, even an E6. Or just early on in their military yep. career, or young in life. Young in life, uh, it, it brings something extra, and it and it. And until you learn how to kind of navigate that, um, I think it can be difficult. And, uh, you know, speak for yourself because, uh, you know, all of them have the same story where somebody was kind of trying to use them for a purpose and yeah. and they weren't necessarily down on it. And, uh, and you uh, you know, it comes with some protocol that's pretty heavy. Um, and it might, you know, it's actually a, a bigger deal than you're necessarily your rank. And it, it is going to change your career. So if you think you're going to go back and be a squad leader, Anonymously in your unit, you know, you're, you're sorry, that's not going to happen. Well, nobody's ever going to treat you the same again while you're on active duty, especially active duty members. Right. They might until they, because they might see you in like your fatigues as yeah. opposed to address. And they'll be like, oh, hey, dude, what's up? Then they'll see in your uh, uniform that would require uh, some type of ribbons. And they're like, oh, that's the fuck. guy. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, you know, all my, all my peers, you know, they, they were, you know, either there or they knew the story. So that was, that didn't change a lot, but as as the younger guys are coming into the unit, yeah, I can see that you know I come into a room and they they all stick to the wall and don't talk, um, and so I can I can see that the difference there is kind of is kind of coming in. Yeah, how much longer are you gonna do? I have uh, just started the med board process, so that I've uh, the army's decided I'm no longer healthy enough to uh, to serve. <laughs> So, you, so the MEB, PEB process? Yep. Let me tell you who went through that. I did. When did you start? Uh, two weeks ago. I actually had my first counseling today on the phone right before the show. Okay. So 
if it if it trends anywhere along my experience, you'll have probably six months to eight months before you get the results. Right. And I think they gave me ninety days post results to kind of get your affairs in order and transition out. And I'm sure you have some leave saved up. So I was like, oh hey, hold on, let me run the math on this. I'm done working here on Tuesday. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I'm getting my timeline uh, on the 11th. They'll kind of lay out yeah. roughly what it looks like. But yeah, it, it looks like it, it's uh, it's happening faster than I anticipated. Um, the process itself, or the fact that the process was started? The, I, I was expecting the process, you know, because I can I can see me not meeting the metrics that keep you in in uh, in the service. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the the process itself seems to be happening quickly, and I, I guess that's a, an adjustment. I guess it used to take you know, a year or two to, to get out, and now it's... it's it dep- uh, I think it depends on the workload of... What the, they're doing. The beauty is you'll get your VA rating and your... What do they call it? A DOD rating? I don't know what they... But, you're going to get two ratings. But you know, instead, of, uh, I guess, the, you know, since I just did the class, you said, you know, tr- in the past, you would get your Army rating, and then, like, two years later, you would get your VA rating. I got mine concurrently. And that, and the new yeah the the new way is that when you walk out the door it's all done and you don't owe uh, anybody anything and your your VA disability checks would so you don't miss a check yeah so you're already past your twenty though right yep so you could retire what uh, is there just a difference in benefits to go the PEB MEB route um, I think it makes it easier and okay. I don't have to fill out a retirement packet I don't know if you've ever seen one they're like this thick never got that far. yeah <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know this is my first time uh, so I, you know I don't know. What are you going to do when you get out? I uh, haven't figured that out yet either. So, uh, But definitely, I'm going to be a super cool dad. Um, breakfast How many kids? I have two. What age? Uh, eight and 12. Okay. So I'm Boy, st- girl? Uh, boy, girl. My, my son's eight, daughter's 12, Lincoln and Lillian. Um, and they still think I'm cool, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay on the ground floor and be a cool dad until... And, and you uh, have one year left with that with your yeah. daughter, for clarity. Right. So Mine's 14. You so, are looking at the abyss right, right. now. Right. And I've, she's uh, she's already having bad mornings, and the only thing that makes it worse is if I ask what's wrong. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> yep, but I think for that first year, um, that's I just want to do that um, and uh, pay him back for for all the time I've been gone. You know, I got I think probably fifty four months deployed time, and that you know that's not counting all the the training and miscellaneous yep. trips in there. So I think they they earned that, and uh, I'm gonna. I'll do that until they get bored of me and don't think I'm cool, and then I'll, I'll go find a job. Where do you guys live in now? So we're living in uh, Graham, Washington right now, but uh, Florida has been uh, seducing my wife. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we get invited down there. Hopefully only metaphorically here. I mean, uh, metaphorically, yes. Because yeah. the, there's literally, some crazy fuckers down in Florida who might try that literally. Well, literally? Yeah. Well, that good luck, because I married a, a angry snapping turtle of a woman, so... <laughs> Uh, I think Florida is the home with the angry mm. snapping turtle. They know how to handle them then. <laughs> but uh, yeah, they, they the the government and the the companies down there uh, and the and the you know SOCOMs down there. So we yeah. do events down there pretty pretty regularly. And and uh, she she's in charge of retirement. She had to follow me around for twenty five years. So yeah, she gets to uh, she gets to pick where we retire. And right now she's picking Florida. What does she want to do, or what does she do? She doesn't want to do another Washington winter. I I can understand that. It's a, <laughs> yeah, you get it's, a little sporty. Yeah, she's been single mom in it uh, uh, for for uh, what 12, 12, 13 years up at first group. Yeah, and uh, you can always tell when there's going to be a bad winter storm because I'll be deployed. So she's been uh, dealing with that on her own. Shortly after the washing machine breaks. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. Yeah. How do you know the roof's going to leak? Well, I'll be in the southern Philippines. It's probably going to leak. Yeah. In a week or two. Within a week of me being gone, the fridge mm-hmm. is going to break. We'll definitely have a home insurance claim that you'll need like both signatures for. Yep. A note. <laughs> and a, and, and this, hey, your power of attorney. I don't like this one. Do you have another cop? Have him sign a different one. Like, yeah, I'll be right on top of that. But uh, yeah, she's been doing that. She doesn't want to. She wants to. She wants to not do another um, nine month winter in, in the Pacific Northwest. So that's what we're we're gonna we're gonna run away and not do those anymore. Well, you're certainly gonna you're gonna get the uh, temperature difference that you're looking for. Yep. You're also gonna get a whole. Me- the the technical term is metric fuck ton of crazy. Yep. Almost or, every video and by for Florida clarity, man, yeah. I love watching crazy shit on the internet, but I can tell which ones are in Florida. 
because yeah. they're the most insane ones. Yeah, you're like, what is that? Those aren't, that's not a full set of clothes. And why does he have an alligator in the bed of his truck? And why is he riding a motorcycle in flip flops with only board shorts on? Yeah, well, those are my people. I grew up in Western Oklahoma, so we we kind of do the same thing. Okay. Yeah, you'll, you'll see stuff like that coming down the road. You're like, that, that truck doesn't have any doors or glass in it, and they're going 90. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> do you have any idea? I mean, how old are you now? I'm uh, 43 today. Today's my birthday. So Awesome. Happy birthday, man. Yeah. Thank you for uh, sharing it with us. You bet. So average life, life expectancy in the U.S. is like 78. You're definitely going to hit 90, though. I mean, like, come on. I, you know what? I think I, I keep seeing all these Medal of Honor recipients. Uh, whatever whatever it is about surviving yeah. those weird battles, they all yeah, they all go they go far, you know? They, so you out. got another lifetime left. Yeah. What do you think? I I didn't plan I uh, that far. Um, I guess that's just the, I don't know, that's my own little operator syndrome. I never made big plans for... For yeah. after it was over and honestly i never um i never planned what year we were going to retire uh, when i was going to leave and and uh i always said i was going to leave when they when the mps came and drug me off the compound so <laughs> what's happening to you now it's just yeah. another version of that that's yeah, just the white much. glove treatment of the MPs. well also my wife was like that's a stupid idea we're, that is yeah. not what we're doing what do you think you would have done if you had not joined the military prison probably yeah do you even remember or can you remember the person that you were before you joined? Yeah, he was an idiot. <laughs> but yeah, but how old were you? Uh, 20. Yeah, those go hand in hand. Yeah, yeah. I was 18 when that's, I joined. Actually, I was 17. I was a fucking junior in high school when I joined. That's I, Yeah, I joined the National Guard in, as a as an 18-year-old junior in high school. Yeah. I mean, if I gave you an hour and a piece of paper and a pen, you would struggle to list three people at that age that aren't idiots. Right. And I have two sons. They're 19. And one seventeen, getting ready to be eighteen, and I love them to death. Idiot. Their decision making <laughs> process is fucking flawed yeah. in many ways, and my daughter is just straight out batshit crazy. Yeah, I, <laughs> I don't think I was. Uh, yeah, I don't think I made a really great decision until probably twenty five. I started yeah. actually kind of steering them around. So yeah, I don't. I don't think that the me being on my own uh, without the structure of the military was any kind of useful. Served any useful purpose for myself or or the community? Well, I ask because you know, I mean, I think back in my own life, and people say, "Well, what do you think you would have done had you not joined the military?" I actually, I struggle. I can remember things that happened in my life at that age, but I struggle to either recognize or remember the the person that I was. Like, I remember doing dumb shit, but I can't articulate why. Yeah, and I also. You know, grow, oh, I'll be a fireman. I want to be, for me, it was like an oceanographer. I don't know where the fuck I got that idea. Probably would be an amazing job. But I don't even, I, I struggle to connect to that person. I, I, I still connect to him. Um, but I was, um, man, I was I was like looking for those, those I don't know if you ever, all the, the early Jack London stuff. Um, Adventure. the Adventures at sea. Like I was like, I, want, I need not... Uh, you know, I grew up in a farming community where, like, the ranches were the exciting part yeah. of life, and that's not profoundly uh, super exciting, despite what Yellowstone sells you. Um, so I always knew I was leaving, and I was looking for, you know, all this. I need this. I need this thing that's going to be exciting. And uh, what was that old magazine? Uh, you picked it up at gun shows all the time. It had uh, Hustler. Not well. Yeah. It was, <laughs> no, it had. Uh, it always had the French Foreign Legion or the. Uh, oh, mercenaries, you know what I'm talking about. Soldier of Fortune? Soldier of Fortune. Yeah, yeah. I, would, I had to... Uh, not a lot of soldiers in that and very little of, fortune. Very little fortune. Looking but back, it, yeah. And it was all made up, you know, now... 100%. After, after... You know how I know that? Fucking Steven Seagal was in those magazines. Yeah. That guy's a walking dick slap. And, and now I go back and I actually... My dad's like, hey, here's your stuff from your room. And, you know, I had these... I'm like, this is a made up... This guy's full of shit. But, <laughs> you know, whatever. It's a... Uh, it's adventure yeah. comics for people of a certain age, and it worked for me. So I was like, I have to go, and I want to go and be in the Seleucy Scouts. And, and I'm like, I know that's. Do you have a history of military service? With yes. Your family? Yeah, yeah. My my uh, my family. That's what they do. Um, all army? No, well, no, we all join the Marine Corps, and then we go to the army. So that's that's the family way. I have I have questions. As one, so, why wouldn't you just join the army? Because you <laughs> once you have served in the Marine Corps. Your children have to serve in the Marine Corps because when you tell them not to serve in the Marine Corps, they take it as that you think that they're not tough enough to go to the Marine Corps. So they, uh, yes, and it's a trap 
uh, either uh, by design or just by default, but it works. And uh, my dad tr- tried to get me not to join the Marine Corps, and I was like, <laughs> he, do- he doesn't think I'm as tough as he is. I'll show him. And uh, and I've watched it happen to my butt. I have friends now that we serve with, like, hey, I need you to talk to my son. He's trying to go to the – he wants to be a Marine infantryman, and I can't get him not to do it. And I'm like, it's a – you can't. You cannot do it. Yeah. You're like you told him the, you're the one that told those stories at Thanksgiving. So like that's that round has left the the barrel and you're just gonna have to deal with it. I mean, that part of who I was I can connect to. Once I made the decision to go down the path that I wanted to, it I my parents could have lined up every person that we knew where I was growing up to tell me that it wasn't a good idea and this was my experience of like cool story. Yeah. Hold my beer. Cause you you guys tell me all sorts of stuff like not to drink and drive and don't no. climb windmills in a lightning storm. You guys just don't want me to have fun. I think the second example you gave is probably good advice. <laughs> I have never climbed a windmill, but I don't, I'm don't. i assuming a large portion of it is made out of metal, and I would not do that in a lightning so storm. So my dad always told me to, st- to stay off the windmill because you have to oil it, and he ma- had all these rules, and he's like, when it's, you know, if the wind hasn't been calm and it's after 10, you can't climb the windmill. And I was like, God, this guy and his dang rules. Does it power something? No, it's... it's uh, if it, in, in Western Oklahoma, the wind is just spontaneous and and strong, and uh, you know it's b- basically what he what he had observed and given me was the you know jumpmaster rules like if it, hey if it's over these gusts you're dead for an hour or whatever. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I, I climbed a windmill and you know, I got probably like after school on a windy day and the wind you know shifted on me and blew me off the windmill. I didn't get hurt, so I didn't have to tell him about it. But yeah, you know I I've always disregard good advice as, as rapidly as I get it. I live most of my life that way as well. <laughs> it's it's a way to live. There's a lot of pain associated. Yes. Yep. Physical, emotional, mental. Yeah. Yep. It's, it's you're constantly in a fight yep. in some way shape or form. I think my, my dad probably has 2000, 3000 hours of just staring at me going, "Why?" <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm edging up on that with my own children as well. It is uh I think that's just it's just payback. Yep, it is. The system is designed to make sure that you suffer, yeah, equally for the, if for the not wrongs more. that you have done. 100%. So you got to yeah. reap that. Hundred percent. All right. So you go off into the Marine Corps. How was yeah. that? And also, why did you decide to get out of that and go right into the Army? Uh, well, I did. I did ten years in the in the Marine Corps. Um, it was a uh, yeah, it was neat. You know, I, was, I, f- I found what I was looking for. What did you do in the Marines? I was an infantryman. Okay. And um, I checked. I wanted to be stationed overseas. So when you fill out where you, your duty station, I just I, there's an overseas box, uh, and the only place you can be stationed overseas as a Marine infantryman is Hawaii. So I I went to Hawaii, okay, which was sure I'll take yeah. it, and uh, um, that was about 2000. So I my first we have the, the Marine Corps had a unit deployment program where you would go forward deploy, and uh, and that's when you know 911 occurred and the adventure changed to something yeah. a little more profound. Yeah, for sure. Conceptual to uh, practical is how yeah. I describe it. So did you do your first pre-9-11 or post-9-11 deployments as a Marine as opposed yep. to the Army? Okay. Yeah, so I, I deployed probably two weeks after 9-11 uh, to Bahrain. Um, we we were all jazzed up. We thought we were going to be a part of the invasion of something because at, at that point we still didn't know where we were invading. Yeah. Um, and it turned out to be Afghanistan, and we, we guarded the USNS Maritime Fleet instead, which, you know, not – the big adventure that I signed up for. Morale was probably super high. Morale was was not great. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and we were, you know, the whole organization was going from peacetime to war footing and figuring out which rules and regulations serve purposes and not. And we were just, you know, just, it, it was not fun. Yeah. Had, uh, How long like, were you guys there for? <clears throat> seven months. So I, you know. That's, that's would, a long road. Yep. And I, I had a, Sandbags in a fighting position on the bow of a merchant vessel, and and I would go sit in it with my Kevlar and uh, dust goggles and my M16A2, and and guard it from, you know, I don't know stuff. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> How many live rounds would they let you take? We had all the live rounds, but <laughs> um, uh, you know the Marine Corps, this, and that's one of those like. Transitions. They were obsessed with not losing a single round of ammunition, and we had boards that had your full um, you know, 180 round um, issue in it. And then after every shift, you'd put your 
Oh, get the fuck Put out! Put your of ammo here. in your board, and then your uh, NCO would come by and like, yes, he has every round, and then uh, you you know polish him because yeah. we're at sea and we have this ammo that we never shoot and it's yeah. corroding like crazy, and then we load it back up. Would they let you have a round in the chamber and watch? Um, no, it's bush. It, yeah, yeah, it was it was not exciting. <laughs> but you know, we we did get to shoot at people uh, probably every, once a month, so that kept it like uh, warning shots. Uh, yeah, I mean, we tried to shoot them, but they're if you're on a ship and they're on a boat, uh, and the, it's uh, Iranians harassing the fleet as it uh, navigates the Straits of Hormuz. It's a complex geometric problem. Yeah, uh, <laughs> there's a lot man, of angles like, and such. I'm like, man, why couldn't I wish I was there now with the skills I have now? Because I'd have been just crushing them off the boat left and right. It's still a tough shot. It's, it's still like, a t- but uh, yeah, red three, dot, three dimension, you know, three yeah. three axes is going on there for sure. Yeah, because uh, yeah, even with the the. The 240 and the saw, they're, they're, they're threading the needle. Yeah. Um, Allah's with those guys. Sometimes. Sometimes. Yeah, yeah. sometimes not. Because yeah. every now and then you see a game, dink. Yep. <laughs> All right, so riveting deployment for seven months to <laughs> Bahrain. What happens when you get back from that? So then I'm like, you know, I, there's, I'm too good for the infantry and I have to get out of here. Yeah. So I'm going to go and uh, try out to be a recon marine, which is a hard, you know, there's just not that many. It's there's not that many of them, so it's and they only do certain assessments. And Hawaii is like the worst place to try and do that because we had no active duty um, recon battalions there. And uh, and I'm you know wiggling around trying to figure out how to do it. And they come and hey, there's a top secret mission. You've been uh, chosen for it. And uh, it wasn't top secret; it was just you know secret. But mm-hmm. so I'm super pumped. Like finally, I'm gonna do something. And I went to the southern Philippines. And uh, guarded the special operations uh, headquarters down there. Uh, that was the secret mission. Yeah, <laughs> huge letdown. So I checked IDs at the Jesota P and uh, and the Chow Hall, and kept all the Green Berets from stealing the chocolate milk because the uh, chocolate milk's very valuable in the Southern Philippines. So after that tour, you're probably just like running to the reenlistment desk because yeah. you just want more time in the Marines. No, right? so that's that's twice now. So <laughs> the the Bahrain mission was secret. The Southern Fuck. Philippines mission was secret. And uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I have, I have my, uh, I have my way in to be a, a force recon marine. Yep. And uh, the p- platoon commander at the time, I can't remember his name right now. He's like, "Hey, we we're going to ask you to stay with the battalion. Uh, there's a, there's a secret mission coming down." <laughs> Would they actually describe it in those terms? Yeah, I That's can't tell fantastic. you. I can't tell you anything about it. <laughs> uh, it's classified. And Fuck by then, know. I'm like, no, <laughs> like yeah. you guys already got me twice with that crap. And uh, so I went, uh, I went to, to ARS to become a force recon marine, and uh, and my battalion went to Iraq and did Phantom Fury. So, and I was miserable because I'm like, you know, I'm getting just destroyed every day. Yeah. And uh, I'm watching my battalion on the news, and I, I was like feeling like the universe was out to get me. Yeah, you were chasing the dragon a little bit for mm-hmm. sure. That's been my big advice. Like, how do I get to war? I'm like, don't, don't try. Yeah, just get get to a, a unit, be useful, and it'll happen. It's like because if you try, you are unless you're the unless your uh, dad is a secretary of defense, um, you do not need to be moving moon at, moving units trying to chase a deployment. I actually watch people do that quite a bit, and, and it they never were, works. They were legitimately some of the most unhappy people because it, you know. The SEAL community was actually really disparate in many ways pre-9-11. Like, each team specialized in something unique. Yep. So, you know, the West Coast teams, like, you might get on an ARG Alpha and Mm -hmm. do a non-permissive shipboarding with – I don't even know if they let them put a round in the chamber, to be honest. This is an MP5 anyway, so good luck with that. And then the East Coast, I think Team 4 was doing some drug interdiction stuff with the DEA down in the jungle. And you would watch people – they're like, fuck, I got to get out of here. Team one's not doing shit. Or they want to go to the East Coast. And then post on 11, you know, there were more SEAL teams than there were places to put the SEAL teams, as yep. there were in all special operations unit. And so you'd see people, they would chase the tail of the dragon, though. Like, oh, my God, that deployment that whatever team just had in whatever location was, in their thought process, unbelievable. So they would go there after that deployment. And who's your source? My buddy, we're yeah. having a beer, and he's like, he's not going to say my trip sucked. He's going to be like, our 
my team's the best team. But they would this. hop. I mean, they would hop around, yep. and so they'd go to the team that they thought just had the most amazing deployment, which and is no guarantee whatsoever. It's that, actually once you learn about the training cycle. Yeah, like you're like, yeah, if you show up to a cool mission, it's over now. You're you're 18 months from something good, good happening. Correct. Yeah, the best advice I can give to people as well is do the best you can to be as prepared as humanly possible, but don't spend. And this is an impossible ask. I, I'm aware. Don't spend an instant worrying about that shit, even though you and I both know they all are going to spend a lot more than an instant yeah. doing so. Also, good luck telling that to a guy that still hasn't been to combat and is desperate yeah. to prove that he belongs in the unit. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. How do you think that metric, how effective do you think that is? The combat versus no combat when it comes to how good of a fill in the blank you are? Well, it's not a it's not a good metric at all. I you know, I uh, know plenty of guys that have uh, deployed that are just awful soldiers, and yeah. uh, I know guys that are great soldiers and you know only have deployed a little bit, and uh, it's a terrible metric. It also only applies during certain times. It, it only applies in certain times, and I think the only thing is um, is it the only thing you can say about a guy that's deployed is that he at least he deployed because every time. A unit gets a warno, like, hey, this you are going to war. You'll always see uh, a few guys squeegee out the back door because they they're they're here for the t-shirts, yeah, and uh, not to actually go down range and and, and be in harm's way. And so it you, happened in the it, SEAL community post nine yeah. eleven. It's like, oh, interesting. It's yeah, people, it's people deciding to get out. We've been training for this it's, for a long time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, four beer. Yeah, four beers in you. You, you can't yeah. wait. Yeah, and fucking gonna, Johnny Rambo I, over there. I'm gonna walk point every day because nobody's gonna steal my kills. And like, what happened? Like, well, you know, fucking IEDs, bro. It, it's just not the. It's not a great time for me and my family. I'm like, oh, you know, you know, me and my family are. We're like, we've been planning for me to go get killed the, the whole year. So it's, it's yeah. great. Indeed. But yeah, you always. Yeah, not a lot of them, but they're they're there definitely there. Floating yeah. around, I, which was a surprise for me because I just uh, had uh, built this up in these elite units that everybody was there uh, to be the guy, and and some people are there just to uh, yeah. Just that to wear the shirt. Uh, that reputation though of those units is what gets more people to want to come to those units. Yep. It's a it's a double edged sword for sure. Uh, uh, the, what I tell people is, regardless of where I ever served in my military career, and for clarity, I didn't do shit like fucking down the middle of the road but in every place that i ever worked there is a bell curve the yeah. top 10 percent and the bottom 10 percent. and if you just focus like okay we're gonna get rid of the bottom 10 percent, another 10 percent fills that in yeah so i've just never found a place where it doesn't exist uh i don't i don't think it is yeah and you know everybody uh what i always tell people is like hey we gotta get rid of that guy he's he's a turd i'm like well i mean Somebody's got to be the armor. Yeah. <laughs> Do you, if we get rid of them, we're just going to have to put somebody else over there. Well, there is always going to be a bottom 10% yeah, as well. Like, he's doing a job nobody else wants. Let's just. Yeah. Is he doing it as well as possible? That's a different conversation. Yeah. Is he redeemable? That's a different conversation. If the answer is no to both of those things, then maybe shit can the person. Yeah. Well, but, also what I found in elite organizations, man, like that bottom 10% would be rock stars anywhere else. Yeah. Uh, but amongst but, their peers, and, but, they still yeah. suck. Yeah, if you were if you were back in the infantry, man, like every every platoon would be trying to get this guy to be be their uh, uh, squad leader or uh, platoon sergeant. And then here, everybody's like trying to kick him yeah. down the hallway. <laughs> but you're not in the infantry, so fucking yeah. do better. Do better. Yeah, just try a little harder. Yeah. Just show up 30 minutes early to everything, please. Yeah. All right, so you're in recon school, watching yep. your unit fucking crush it on the news. Yep. <laughs> And man, if they if I could have quit, and and uh, just gotten on a plane and joined, and them. they're like, "Hey, you're a quitter. You know, go back to your go back to your battalion in Iraq." I'd have quit in a minute. <laughs> uh, but I, I knew that it wasn't that was not how it was going to work, so I had to stay the course, and uh, and it worked out. You know, I became a I became a force recon marine, and then I think I was in my platoon maybe four or five months, and and it was we were. We started our train up to go to Iraq, so okay. I finally got everything I, I was looking for. What year did you land in Iraq the first time? Two thousand five. Okay, how was it? It was it was hot. It so was, summertime. Uh, yeah, <laughs> and it was uh it was the pre surge. Uh, there was tons of work. I remember um, like the SIGACs were, were like you know four or five thousand, 
uh, in theater a day. <laughs> like this yeah. shit was happening all over the place. Which I went back in, in 2008, and it was you know there was like ten things that happened in the whole country. But uh, no, it was awesome. Um, I finally got to you know go get shot at, shoot back. Yeah. Um, you Not know. as exciting as most people would think. Well, it's it's. It's, Depending well, on how close you're getting shot exciting. at. It's very exciting. It's just yeah. not a, you know, you learn a lot about yourself. And yeah. uh, I think every time I've ever deployed and got shot at, I always, you know, when I'm hugging the ground or, or hiding behind something, I'm like, man, why do I keep doing this? And yeah. I always make promises. I'm going to go to do something. Yeah. <laughs> Is there anything else I could be doing right now yeah, that like, would lead even, me to be hiding behind this fucking rock? Yeah, I haven't even re- written my memoirs yet. And if I, <laughs> if I stop one of these rounds with my face, you know, my story ends there. <laughs> yeah. Somebody else is going to have to write it. Yeah. Son of a bitch. And if my friends are all jokesters. They're going to put a bunch of weird stuff in it. That's fair. That, that just means you have good friends. Yeah. So why leave the Marines? You, you, you so, finally deployed <clears throat> to Iraq. You got a deployment under your belt that you were looking for. So, you know... I got over there and and um, I started kind of you know what really I had a mentor and he gave me a uh, a class on mission and authorities and and who was supposed to be doing what and the the kind of stuff I had always been trying to do in the Marine Corps they, they don't do um, or at least at that time you know Marsoc shares uh, some of those mm-hmm. um, but he's like hey man you know if you if you want to be a part of the most elite uh, infantry unit the world has ever known and support that like. You're here. Congratulations. Uh, he's like, if you want to go over here and um, you know do all these other individual tasks and, and uh, that, that uh, are in the, the SOCOM spectrum, and specifically, you know, really SF work, it's like, if this is what you want to do and you want to be like this individual operator type guy, he's like, you need to get out because the Marine Corps dabbles in that, but the Marine Corps is never going to love you for that. Uh, you're always going to be frustrated because the organization – doesn't even want you to do that they want the army to do that um so he's like you either so you either need to like be this guy or leave and go be that guy and uh so i you know i i came back and uh took terminal leave and uh enlisted in the army was there not a way for you just to inter service transfer they forced you to get out and they didn't get force back. me to get out but i i had extended just for the for a deployment uh just long enough to do the deployment and then i had like 60 90 days of leave Anyway, so we came back. You know, I threw all my Marine gear, all my gear at the uh, su- supply kid, and went on leave probably five days after we got back from Iraq. Yeah, and uh, you get a provisional DD two fourteen, which is good enough to join the army. Yeah. So if I if I'd spent more time working on it, I probably could have done an inter service transfer. And I actually, you know, spent a lot of time setting pathways up for for guys that want to emulate that. And uh, so there is a way to do that. Um, if you, you didn't have to go through boot camp again, did you? Uh, I I went to the first day and got my uniforms. Okay. Yeah. And uh, but no, I I didn't have to. Uh, I didn't have to go to boot camp. What was your rank getting out of the Marines, and was, what did uh, they put that you? That was in the it? one mistake I did make. <laughs> <laughs> I was an E five P. Um, promotable. Promotable. I should have uh, extended another month and pinned. <laughs> yes. Because as soon so as you I left as an E four. I left as an E five. But as soon as I joined the Army, I lost all my time and grade, and there is no way really in the Q course to kind of stand out to, to get selected for promotion. So I, I kind of lost uh, I lost a few years of, of uh, a career progression by just not paying attention when I, when I ran out the door. Okay. So you joined the Army as an E-5. Though. I joined the Army as an E-5. Was it tough to go from the Marines to the Army? I mean, it's a different language. It's a different language. Uh, I actually got in trouble a couple times. Um because, uh, you know, cool thing about Marines, they do not lie to you. And uh, uh, the way they deliver information uh, can come off as confronta- confrontational. Conf- confrontational. So I kind of like, hey, you can't just be yelling at people. Uh, and, you know, try to only, in a conversation, say fuck once, you know. Yeah. And I was like, oh, okay. Uh, people don't like that around here. But that was the, big, that was the biggest one. Okay. It's just I had to use more words to talk to people. Yeah, probably. Do, uh, do the Marines and Army share rank insignia? Mm, yes, yeah, sim- similar. Yeah. The Navy fucks it all up. Our, yeah, the, ours is just trash. Yeah, yeah, very same. The Marine Corps just has cross rifles on everything, and, okay. and the Army does not. All right, so now you're in the Army, and yeah. were you able to guarantee a pipeline to SF? Yeah, so I, I went straight to selection. Um, normally, I joined on a, a, the 18 X-ray program, so mm-hmm. I would have... Uh, if I if I had no prior service, I would have done boot camp, um, school of infantry, and then gone to airborne school. 
and then went to uh, um, Fort Bragg. But since I'd already, I was already airborne from my time in the Marine Corps, and once you've gone to Marine Corps uh, uh, boot camp, you don't have to do anybody else's. So I just went straight to selection. That's not a bad pipeline. No, it was it worked out worked out great. Time saving, if you will. Uh, saved me a lot of time. <laughs> well, well, I don't. There was a there used to be a meme out, and it's it's a, of me, and it says, "What's the hardest part of uh, becoming a Green Beret?" It says that you know the first ten years in the Marine Corps. <laughs> That's fair. That is fair. You can. So I, you I don't earn that one. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if I saved time, but yeah. once I decided to become a Green Beret, it was a pretty easy process. Yeah. How was the Q course for you? Well, uh, once again, I knew what. Green Berets were, ish, and uh, I'd seen them, worked with them, gar- kept you know kept them from stealing chocolate milk in the Philippines. It's critical duty. Critical duty. Um, I didn't realize they all have to speak a foreign language, mm. and so my, I I went, got selected, and at that time the first school you went to was language school. If you fail language school, your adventure ends. What'd you randomly get mm. drawn as your language? Uh, I got Indonesian. Which is considered, <laughs> well, it's actually considered an easy language because it has, uh, their alphabet is is the English alphabet. So you don't have okay. to learn. Uh, it's a 26 character alphabet? Yeah, yeah. So all the, when you look, okay. whenever it's written down, you, you read it, maybe some pronunciation differences from, from here okay. back and forth. I'm, I'm back on board. But when you study, it's it's easy to study because the letters make sense. Whereas you, you see the, you know, the poor bastard learning uh, Thai or, or Chinese. Russian or Mandarin. Yes. Yeah, like, Cyrillic language. Here you go. Here's what this these, caricature. What do these little kanjis yeah. mean? He's like, I don't know, man. Yeah. <laughs> Fucking hate being a green beret. <laughs> That's the, uh, uh, if you're if you're ever in a bar and you see uh, a Q Corps student and he's a medic and he's got Chinese or Russian, you know, buy that man a beer because those guys are pulling the heaviest, rustiest plow through the driest earth. They really are. Yeah. I'm glad that there's not a language requirement in the SEAL teams because... We're too fucking dumb. <laughs> I don't that that would increase attrition to well into the high ninetieth percentile. Yeah, that's that's um, you get a different type of guy. I think the, uh, you know, I think all my all my force recon guys are they were they were they have intelligence. It's just not the same, and it, and uh, <laughs> what I call dumb. Yeah, but that language that language school really thins the herd, and you end up with a different yeah. type of person. And, uh, I've always been inc- uh, impressed with Green Berets. So, I mean, like Hafer's a very good friend of mine. Uh, Glover's a very good friend of mine. Um, even, I don't know Tim Kennedy as well, but just listening to the three of them, the ability to articulate what Green Berets do mm-hmm. and the understanding of warfare in general. And I think that might be because, you know, at the That's... at a baseline level, level of the medals, right? Like the mission, mission essential task list. Seals are we're supposed to be an amphibious reconnaissance force, That's, which for clarity we suck at. The Green Beret, well, we suck at it in the modern era because we yeah. haven't been focusing on it. And I say that I've been out for almost ten years, so I don't fucking know. No, they still do. They're coming back though. Yeah, this is their year. They're they're all getting wet again. Go for it, it fuck bon voyage. Yeah, but Green Berets with you know the medal of being fit for an internal defense, the by with and through, mm-hmm. it forces you to have that deeper level of understanding. And the Q course and the, just the. Uh, Everything is is not just uh, solve the problem. When you solve the problem, everybody always asks, "What are the second and third order effects?" Like, if you're going to fix this, what's going to happen? Yeah, here, here, and here. And that just when you start planning and thinking that way, it just makes you a more thoughtful person. And uh, you know, and the job is as a Green Beret, you know, and that's something that that uh, it's, it's very unique. You know, the the SEALs unilateral assault force. That you know, they they. They master this thing. That's not our job. Like we're there, we train, uh, you know, stateside as an ODA, and it, yeah. and it looks similar. But when we deploy, you know, at at the thinnest, that team will be overlaid over an entire infantry battalion, uh, serving as uh, an, an advisor to that battalion commander. Um, which is when you start, you know, planning like that. I'm going to logistically support a battalion on the move. That makes you have to be thoughtful. Well, it changes the way you view the battle space yeah. as well. And, you know, and I, that's my big one is I thought I knew a lot about warfare being a, a force recon team leader. And, you know, you go in and I got my eight guys and they all have food, they all have water, they all have ammo, the radios work, we know the plan, let's go get after it. And then as a, uh, as a Green Beret, you know, like 
in Afghanistan, we'd do an operation. I'd have, you know, 60, 80, 90, 120 guys, and they're not even from the same unit. They're, you know, everybody sent their little batches out. Um, half of them don't have shoes. Half yeah. of them haven't eaten in four or five days. So, like, the first thing we're going to do is feed and water everybody so that they don't all fall apart. But, you know, you, you plan these huge complex movements with with riffraff really yeah and uh it just makes you a, it makes you have to really understand uh you know the battlefield really yeah yeah no i've always appreciated the depth of knowledge and more than anything really the i'm sure there's some that couldn't articulate their way out of a paper bag the ones that i know are incredibly no, we articulate have, yeah we we have we have a couple we keep a couple of those type guys around you need to yeah it makes everybody else look better you know yeah yeah because you know <laughs> the, the 50 cal you know it's powered by um profanity and uh sweat and a smart person cannot make a modus run this is true <laughs> that butterfly trigger on that modus yeah i watched a guy have an ad one time at a 45 degree angle with that sucker yeah falling, that, falling asleep get everybody's attention yeah <laughs> well boo that's, that's where like why are they when they you know they put the safety on that thing now yeah. and they're like well, it was good enough the safety for my used to be like, a sprint, spent casing yeah. jammed underneath the butterfly i was like man if, once somebody nds a 50 cal around you you'll yeah, you'll appreciate it because that yeah. that is it's it's scary when people shoot in un unintentionally, but the fifty cal that is that is an unforgiving round. So the, let's put a safety on it. <laughs> the blast pressure of that thing, man, is unbelievable. Hard to describe for sure. Now to get your attention, yes, and the people downrange too. Yeah, I got a yeah. I when the what is it? Any any time you actually shoot the fifty, it feels powerful, and then when somebody shoots one back at you. Man, you're like, hmm. Yeah. <laughs> this is significant. <laughs> well, you're basically hucking that coffee. Or yeah. Actually, it's more like that water, which is Glover's, oh, yeah. by the way. Yeah, it's it, it's not too much larger than a goddamn 50 cal round. Yeah, if I, I mean, if I just threw one at your face, it would be it would be considered a, a significant assault. Yeah, there's a, Everywhere like, in the United States. There's a heft to it, yeah. for sure. All right, so you're done with the Q course. Where'd you get assigned? First Special Forces Group, because um, I had an Asian language. Uh, so every group's online, you know, um, by their by their theater and if you you know we try to keep the right languages in the right groups yeah and uh you know I, I show up didn't really know what to expect what year are we at at this point uh we're in 2010 now okay and um uh, they sent me to fourth battalion i didn't know groups had battalions uh, but sure and uh i go down and the the sergeant major tony bell um liked me and had plans for me just based off of a, a short interview and and uh anyways like i got this i got the perfect team for you and i was like oh, okay and he's we're walking through this building fourth battalion building it's brand new it's the coolest building i'd ever even seen and it's it's uh you know, there's a misperception you know the movies really oversell uh socom facilities you always think it's plasma screen yeah, tvs the, the size you know, that eyeball wall scanner yeah. and, <clears throat> no well this you know fourth battalion at the time that was the coolest building i'd ever been in so you need <laughs> Their badges to open the doors, and every other door needs a code. Yep. And uh, we're going through this labyrinth, and, and he's never mind. The codes are likely one, two, three, four. Yeah. Or seven, six, the, the two, or standby. five, five, six. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How do you how do you get break into a, a SOCOM facility? Type in seven, six, two, five, five, six. And yeah. You're probably going to be thirty percent of the time. Yeah. And uh, anyway, he opens the door, and there's nothing in it except for uh, a guy sitting on a sitting in a swivel chair with a computer on a bar stool, and uh, that's my ODA. It's it's got two people on it. One of them's gone, and we're getting furniture in a week. And that's I I got sent to a a, a newly formed battalion to support the war on terror. We grew, and I was one of the first people there. And, and uh, we were going to be non deployable for like three years, which is not why I got out of the Marine Corps. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say I don't know if this guy really hooked you up with that choice. <laughs> no, I was I was uh you know I didn't I kept my poker face on, but I was. I was definitely boo boo lipped. Yeah, I was like, "Why?" You know, I'm chasing the tail. I'm like, "The war's going to end before I, before I get over there." That was I was always panicky, uh, traveling around because the war's going to end. You know, the the, the next trip's going to be the last one, and yeah. little did I know it's going to last. You know, two decades. So yeah, no shit, right? Right. <laughs> so you didn't deploy from that place until 2013. No, so we 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 got there, and that was the plan. But you know, that was uh, they just needed us. So, so like six months later, I think we started our our, our first uh, deployments. We started doing J sets in Asia, okay, uh, to take up those missions so that the uh, second and third battalion could concentrate on Iraq and uh, Afghanistan. And then, how long was it until you deployed to either of those countries, Iraq or Afghanistan? Um, 
So 2013. So. Okay. Yeah. So the uh, deployment you got the you were awarded the medal yeah. of honor for. So where they de- uh, where they put you guys in so Afghanistan? I went to. Uh, originally, I was in a, a town called Miri, and uh, we were doing the. the uh, v- village stability operations. VSO, right. yeah, yeah. Which is that name has changed so many times. So many times, yeah. It's like actually, it's not VSO because we went to do VSO when we got there. It was DSO, uh, district, district. So. Yeah, but just meant less ODAs in an area instead of instead of more. And you know, that was um, what was province it? was that in? I think it's an Andar province. Okay, and then uh, and I actually got my award in, in the Ghazni province, but. Uh, yeah, that was it. Was neat. That's how I actually fell in love with being a Green Beret. I I'd, uh, I wasn't for sure that I was in the right place. I was uh, going to go out for you know some of the tier one selections, mm-hmm. but man, that that uh, being an ODA on the ground, being the only Americans, you know, in a, an entire province, and uh, just fixing problems with whatever you came up with was just uh, I lo- I loved it. It's empowering for yeah, sure. Yeah, it's empowering, and I'm you know I'm an ADHD guy, so I can't do the same thing twice anyway. So yeah, um, I, yeah, I loved it. Uh, and where in the cycle of that deployment did the events around the middle of so, the occur? You know, we we got there and we started hitting a battle rhythm, and our problem was we we were doing really well, and uh, and like you said, there was there was more places for for there was more teams than there was places for them, and. Uh, the SEALs were getting involved with doing VSO because they were like seeing like, yeah. hey, nobody needs a unilateral strike force at this point in the war. This is if you don't have a partner, you can't even get a comp approved. And uh, so we turned over our site to them, which you know we were super bummed about. Yeah. And uh, I ended up, I got a choice anyway. So I'm sitting there and we just been crushing it. And my the same sergeant major Tony Bell comes in and he's looking for me. And uh, usually the sergeant major is looking for you. That's bad for sure. But I, I was like, nope, I've been crushing it. <laughs> and he's like, I'm, I'm either going to send you home or you have to come work for me, which is typically punishment in the uh, in the soft world. Uh, but you know, we were just we, we had to cut our our signature, uh, our force down, and uh, so I picked work for him because you know headquarters work is still deployed work. Yeah. And uh, anyway, I became the uh, weapon sergeant for the for the company. So. What would that what would that look like in garrison and what does that look nah, like overseas? So, it's um my my big thing is I forecast what the teams need ammo wise and then I gotta figure out how to get it out to them. Um so logistically supporting the ODAs that are still out in their, their VSO sites. Okay. You know, valuable work. Yeah. Interesting, not fun. Nobody would go to selection to do that job. Uh, I know I did not, but it is a job that has to get done though. That's yeah. a, that's literally the lifeblood of the ODAs yeah, out there. You know, so and uh, while I'm disappointed, a I have two things. I don't want to get anybody killed because I don't have the job I want. So I, you know, throw myself after it. And I still got to keep a good reputation. So hopefully, uh, if somebody needs another Green Beret, I can I can get out of the company headquarters and, and go back to another team. Yeah. But anyway, uh, the Taliban decided to come on on base, so I didn't have to worry about that. They decided to do like a field trip. Yeah, field trip. <laughs> <laughs> These mountains suck. Let's let's see. You know, yeah. Instead of we've always wanted to know yeah. what's inside of it. We've heard you American got great fob. DVDs for sale. Yeah. <laughs> Instead of wasting all that time having us patrol around, let's just go to the American base. It is time saving. Yeah, it really is. It did. It saved a ton of time. Yeah, yeah. So, lay it out there. What the fuck happened? Uh, also, we just had a one of the reasons I was uh, able uh, to respond so quickly is we had a change of command photograph and uh i wanted to look really cool for that picture so i had all my gear set up uh i went and got the coolest sniper rifle that i had i was a sniper i forgot to bring it up this is all incredibly fortuitous though yeah (laughs) uh so i had the you know i took a picture and i had all my gear yeah just so that because you know operators are awful so if you if your gear's not on point they'll make you know that picture's out there forever so i was like i'm gonna look legit And I had my radio on and had, you know, all my stuff set up for this picture and uh, didn't go put my gear up right away. Before you get into the actual events of what happened, describe, if you will, the FOB and kind of the province you were in and the area around the FOB. So it's a it's a significant um, area, um, the, the city of Ghazni, um, to the Taliban and um, and uh, they wanted it. To, for bragging rights, and we were—it was a Polish fob. It was on a list of fobs to get closed, 
So the Taliban found out we were going to close it. So that it's a it's a win win. If they attack it and overrun the fob, cool beans for them. If yeah. they attack it and and the attack failed. They still know we're going to close it, so they still get to claim credit for. It's a victory for them either yeah, way. Yeah, so that like the win is always going to happen for these guys. Um, How big was the fob? Uh, it wasn't incredibly big, so it was kind of shaped uh, like a, a a misshapen oval. The narrow side being uh, about nine hundred meters across the thin part of it, and probably yeah, maybe maybe two two clicks long. Did it have some open space around it, or so, was it bumped nah, up against? No, it was bumped up against it. So okay. um, on one side was just the open desert, and then on the front of it we had a highway, which spilled off into the city, and then on that other side spilled off into the city. I'm going to guess they didn't attack from the open desert They portion. did not attack. Well, they did attack from the open <laughs> desert. Uh, Maybe to draw your eyes away. Uh, well, actually, they, they uh, so they launched the attack. Uh, they detonated a um, you know three to 5,000-pound bomb, depending on who was doing the cooking. V-bid? Yep. It was a, a cement truck that was completely full of, of explosives. Fuck. So From you know, gate? Si- no. Uh, just a random. It was the only part of the. Weird. They picked the only part of the camp wall that didn't have a tank ditch. So. Okay. Because, yeah. So you're. And, uh, anyway, it was, we had a small airfield on the camp, and they attacked right in the middle of it, which um, didn't make a whole lot of sense until, you know. Later is is a there's nothing out there. So they anyway they pushed an assault force of of twelve to fifteen uh, fighters through that that breach point. It was about sixty meters wide. Mm-hmm. And uh, surprised it wasn't wider with the cement truck. Yeah, well that's the there was an incredible crater out there. So uh, yeah, it yeah it took it took them. Well, the poles got it filled in by the next morning, but they had they were they were out there with heavy equipment, really yeah. getting after it. Um. And then simultaneously, on the other side of that, um, they had a, they'd put fighters in a, a hotel that overlooked the camp. Somehow, we let somebody build a, a three-story hotel that the the top the top floor and roof overlooked the entire camp. So, uh, fail. And they they put a bunch of uh, you know recoilless watt rifles, RPG teams. Uh, I think they had like sixty to eighty fighters in that hotel. Fuck. Yeah. Oh, and they actually had like a three-tube mortar section set up. Really? It was incredibly well done. Really, uh, as much as I'd like to claim credit, they just had terrible luck uh, overall. Because uh, they had a 20,000-pound V-bid that was uh, driving up the road in the middle of the attack. Um, and the fuel pump went out on the truck. And uh, the driver just got out and walked off into the city. So we spent the next week after the attack just try, you know, slowly tearing that thing apart and uh, detonating it. And then the uh, the third wing of the attack from the open desert, they had another, uh, you know, three to five thousand pound V bid, and uh, an Afghan police officer s- spotted it and was like, "That's a V bid," and whipped out an RPG and and shot it at like thirty yards and you know, vaporized him, but you know, blew the truck up. So uh, just bad luck for them because the the only real. Um, Success they had was the on on the, the the side of the camp where I was at, and uh, we had s- probably like five or six suicide vests that we recovered um, that they had buried on the camp, and we had Afghan workers that had put them on during the during the attack, and whatever the signal was, uh, they never got it. So they we found those you know covered in sweat, yeah, dumped off, and and the guys were gone. Where were you when that first V bid popped so off? I was hanging out with the. Uh, um, company medic, because that's the other job nobody wants. And you know, we we're having coffee, moping about why we weren't um, on teams because we're and we're both snipers. And you know, the most annoying thing in the room, other than a, than a seal, is a is a sniper. Except for a seal sniper. A seal sniper is yeah, that's the apex predator of of guy you don't want to be in a room. Hundred percent. Yeah. And uh, we were you know we we're ready to win the war on terror if we could just get out there with our rifles. But uh, yeah, we're hanging out in his in his room and and uh, his little med shed. Probably about this big as the uh, office here, and and uh, we both ended up in the floor, and all his medical supplies were just on top of us. How far from the we're, detonation? So were we're eight hundred meters from it, Fuck. and it was it was, still. It felt like almost, I still yeah. remember. It felt like the whole building jumped up three feet. Yeah. And uh, any question in your mind what it was? Yeah, because we had been receiving indirect fire almost daily for like two weeks prior to that. Um, I thought just to harass the camp. 
Um, and, you know, because a round lands, that all the alarms go off, everybody sits in a bunker, EOD goes around and like, yep, a round landed. Yeah. Don't worry, it detonated. I'm like, yeah, we, I know it detonated. We heard the explosion. Yeah, we heard that part. Yeah, and it's like a, you know, it's an hour, two hour thing. And I, we thought that was the big, it was just the harassment and the, the tax on our time. But what they were actually doing was mapping out where every soldier was taking cover uh, and building a shot card so that they could um, accurately engage the camp with their artillery. They were also, to a degree, conditioning the response. Yes, that is the, that is the other big thing is, you know, between I got to the point where, like, honestly, I wouldn't leave the SF camp because I didn't want to get caught on the on the conventional side during one of these attacks and get stuck in a bunker. Yeah. Um, so, you know, around that time in the morning, like definitely after 10 and before one, I would never leave the SF camp. That way, at least, you know, when, when this artillery round lands, I can I can sit in my room and Freed, read a book or something. Freedom yeah. to a degree, yeah. But, uh, yeah, anyway, everybody knows that, hey, in the morning, there's going to be an explosion. You're going to go sit in the bunker for two hours and, and, and chill. And uh, anyway, when they – that's that's what they, uh, they built that into us and observed it and then uh, came after us real hard with it. And uh, the, the first rounds of our of our indirect fire actually hit the camp generator, and which which caused a lot of problems because it's a, it's a fob, you know. Yeah. Um, and it's got like power lines, and the the radios are all are hardwired in, and it's not a it's not a four deployed deployed uh, operation center. It's not it doesn't have all these redundancies. Yeah. And the the backup generator was actually right next to the primary. That's super smart. Yeah, for for maintenance wise. Yeah, makes for it maintenance <laughs> and like sharing fuel, that's spectacular. For an indirect one hundred and five or whatever might so, come flying in there. So the the uh, the the poles actually had a really hard time getting the word out. Like, hey, uh, what is it? I can't remember. I'll get it wrong. But we were, you know, whatever condition red, which is shelter in place, and they were realizing it was black which is you know hey every everybody come out the camp is being uh, attacked attacked yeah it's yeah. every man for himself and uh you know a lot of times people didn't know that there was even the camp had been penetrated for two days because uh, really yeah because they're they're in their bunkers no radios uh a lot of the units were retrograding out so there's these people just they don't have permission to leave the bunker they're not really getting information obviously they knew there was a significant attack because uh, indirect fire was just landing. There was no place on that camp where you were more than uh, probably 20 meters from some kind of indirect fire detonating. Um, so everybody knew that the shit hit at the fan. They just didn't know what, to what degree. What degree? Yeah. And uh, and that's what that's the other reason that we were so successful is we didn't we just left our camp because I I heard small arms fire. Uh, once I realized that indirect fire had not hit the building I was in because that's what I originally thought. Yeah. After you um, tunneled yourself out of the yeah, medical supplies. Yeah, taking my bandages and <laughs> IVs off me. And uh, I go outside, and uh, there's a, you know, it went from being a perfectly clear day, and I'm walking out to tell everybody that, hey, we're fine, don't worry about us. Uh, and I walk out, and literally the entire camp has like a, a fog of, of, of dust on it. And I was like, well, that's not indicative of, you know, a a 60 millimeter mortar round landing over here. This is something more significant. And then, you know, I heard the, all the small arms and the rockets, everything, you know, kind of picked up right after I walked outside. Yeah. And, and I was like, mm, I know what this is uh, significant. How'd your day progress from there? Well, luckily, you know, I didn't put my stuff up. So I, yeah. I was instantly a special forces uh, sniper ready to be employed. And uh, now I just had to figure out how to get to the fight. And uh, we only had a, had a guy driving a Toyota pickup to pick up our mail, um, and he didn't need the truck anymore. Left the keys in the ignition, and uh, we we piled in it. Me, Nate Abkemeyer, and Drew Busick uh, hopped in it and, and headed for the gunfight. Probably towards the breach in the wall, I'd imagine. Uh, so we we actually pulled out directly in the face of the uh, hotel. Oh, excellent! Uh, so they know, could see you. And well, you the could Taliban see didn't tell me the whole plan, so we're, <laughs> I'm just kind of wing. I'm trying to play along. Totally. They're, you know, they're leading the dance at this point, but my, my job as a weapon sergeant is security of the AOB also. It's my uh, other task. And I was like, ah, I got to shut the gate before we leave guys. It's the, it's my one thing. <clears throat> so they pull forward and I'm shutting the gate and, uh, everybody in the hotel was like, Hey, there's that idiot in that Toyota again. And, uh, so they all started shooting at it. Uh, I didn't know that. So I'm just making sure the gates locked nicely. And I, I came out and, and, uh, 
you know, Drew and Nate were pretty excited that we needed to move the truck rapidly. Yeah, they had some suggestions like, about get, just sitting get there. Get in. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, we started uh, driving toward the toward the um, breach. Yeah, you could see it. It was a mushroom cloud. Yeah, probably you know probably almost you know fifteen hundred, two thousand feet. I mean, it was a monster. And uh, so we started heading toward it, and uh, on the way there, I had another. Uh, my company warrant with a medic from another ODA. They pulled up beside us on a four wheeler and they're pointing thumbs up and, and we're like, yeah, yeah, we're going too. let's get after it. And, uh, you know, we pull on down and I, I had, a, uh, you know, I had my sniper rifle and I can kind of, as we're getting there, I can kind of see the support by fire position that they have. And I can see the airfield and, and I was going to ease out of the truck and climb up on this wall. And, uh, you know, Chief Colbert and uh, and uh, his uh, four wheeler pulled just past us, and they just just get annihilated by small arms fire. Uh, I couldn't see where it was coming from, but I could you know you could see the rounds hitting them, and yeah. I could see them getting hit. Uh, we have a battle drill for that, so we we instantly go into pulling that uh, Toyota in between them and that fire. And uh, I you know I have my big stupid sniper rifle. What'd you have at the time? I had a Mark Twenty, so it's the the it's a. It's an accurized, heavy version of the Scar Heavy. So it's a 308. It's a 308. So you had a women's rifle. That's fine. Yeah. Man <laughs> used 300 Win Mag. It's not uh, a big deal. I almost <laughs> I almost switched over to a 300 Win Mag. I was like, you know, I'm, nobody's going to take me in as an assaulter on their team. But at sniper support, I bet they'll let me do that. I was like, I'm going to I'm gonna need a 300 Win Mag bolt gun. Yes. And I had one in my room. You know, I had a Mark 13. And I was like, I'll, I'll, sw- I'll switch tomorrow. And thank God I didn't switch, man, because all I did was freaking <laughs> shoot guys at like, you know, six feet away yeah. uh, rapidly. So the, the bolt gun probably would have got me killed. Um, but, you know, we, we pull in. And I got this big stupid thing. It does not fit in a Toyota Tacoma really well. And uh, as we uh, we pull through to block that fire, we, we see all these Afghan uh, soldiers standing around. And I'm like, perfect. I don't know what they're doing over here, but I'm a Green Beret. Put these guys to work. Uh, surprises on me because they all just faced inboard and started shooting our truck. And, you know, that's when we found out the Taliban had decided to dress up like Afghan army because uh, they tried dressing up as U.S. soldiers an attack a, a couple months prior. It's not going to work. Did not work. You know. Uh, you know they wore tennis shoes and everybody's like, yeah, that's not your uniform. I can tell from 300 meters that your uniforms messed up yeah so they just instantly shot him so they but fooled me for a second um <clears throat> you know and i presented my rifle and fired one round and it jammed fuck uh, yeah <laughs> fuck yeah that was my first experience with this car heavy as well i think that <laughs> i think i stuck the charging handle against the door frame because literally that rifle had never jammed before and it never jammed was ever. it the same reciprocating charging yep. what a fucking dog shit design i heard the seals demanded it Probably, but it was but, probably more than anything because we would hang our hair, hair gel off of that. Right. So when you're using so you it, come it's back closer. And constantly, yeah. correct. But no, I know so many people who are like my thumb. I'm like, oh, at once, yeah. <laughs> Even me, I was excited about the rifle, and yeah. I, the first thing I did was eat my thumbnail what off. What a with it. dog shit design! And it's funny, like that uh, they they release a non reciprocating charging handle for it, and it costs like three hundred bucks. And yeah, yeah, it uh, that is one of those rifles where I opened it the first time. And I'm like, wait a minute. So this is going to move back and forth right where my natural hand position wants to be. Viciously? Yeah. yeah. It, like, what kind of ass? Who? Who? Give me the name. Yeah. I want the, I want the name. Yeah. Um, yeah. But anyway, I think, I, I think that's what got me. That's the only thing I can come up with. But I didn't have a whole lot of time to analyze it because everybody was trying to kill me. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but, you know, I'm at this point several years deep of when your rifle goes down, your pistol comes out. Uh, and... And I honestly, I was I, I thought they had me because I'm like I'm staring at like five muzzles. What distance? Uh, probably ten meters. Oh fuck. Yeah, I was like, shit. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I just pulled my pistol and start closing the distance, and I was like, well, I hope I hope Drew and uh, Nate figure something else out. What was your sidearm of choice that day? Uh, Glock 19. Not bad. No, yep. Yeah. Not bad. It worked. Yeah. And uh, anyway, I just I just, I just ran toward him uh, while firing my pistol and. Just started getting a piece of everybody, and and uh, they kept missing me until we were right on top of one, of one another. Yeah, 
And uh, yeah, I don't know. God, he takes care of drunks and fools, and I'm, I'm dual qualified, apparently. Yeah. All right. So you encounter in what you think is an Afghan force. They surprise cockbag you because they're Taliban yep. in Afghan attire. You get one round out of the scar, essentially, which is one more than many people do sometimes. Yeah. Straight to the old Glock 19. It just, it does the work. It does the work. You close the distance. I feel like the firefight continued on even after you yeah, so I got killed right the, that small <clears throat> group of people. So I hit, well, I hit one of them and he, and he just, I hit him in the hips. Yeah. You know, we, you know, if there's a vest, you go for the pelvic girdle or yeah. something. So I just naturally went after him. And, uh, uh I, I assumed that they knew that he was going to cack his vest off because as soon as he went down, everybody just bounced. <clears throat> Hmm. I didn't know what was going on, you know, still. I haven't got the warn from the Taliban. Um, but I, I was – so at this point, I'm just kind of around the corner from everybody, from the truck and, and from uh, Chief Colbert. And, uh, you know, my pistol, I got like three rounds left in it probably. Uh, and my rifle's jammed. So I, I didn't want to go back around the corner because then these guys are just right on top of us again. And I needed to fix my rifle. Um, my gun belt's still in the truck because I never put it on. Uh, so I was, it's a good spot for it. Yeah, I actually had. <laughs> I was like, I had a, I had my little sniper purse. Yeah, that had all, all my stuff in it, you know, and left that in the truck too. Uh, anyway, I had a stuff, a lot of stuff I needed, uh, but I, I got through it. Um, but I had a hand grenade, and uh, I was like, well, this will create some, you know, distraction. So Fuck I just, yes, it will. So I pulled the, pulled the uh, pin on it, just kind of flicked it out there in front of me, and, and the guy I'd hit in the hip was still laying there. And so when I just kind of come around this water tank and tossed it, it it literally stuck between him and the ground. And uh, which usually is unsettling to some people, but this guy was real calm and just pulled his pulled his rifle up and just started engaging me with his with his AK uh, as I pulled back behind a concealment, not cover, just an empty water tank. And I went to work on my rifle, uh, getting this this jam done. And I still remember uh, little pieces of white plastic just fluttering down all over me because he was just, just hammering away at me until the grenade went off and, and just, you know, cut him in half. Yeah, shred him to pieces, yeah. I'm sure. And uh, But anyway, that's, you know, the for me, that's the coolest part of the story is because uh, I had a complex malfunction in my scar, and I got my gun up in three to five seconds, uh, so says the manufacturer of U.S. hand grenades, um, and had my rifle up and ready to get back in the fight. How'd the fight continue from there? Well, somebody had noticed me at this point, and uh, I started hearing that snap thump of uh, rounds coming. And uh, I remember dirt pouring down the back of my back of my neck. And uh, there was a guy probably 100 meters out on the flight line, and he's uh, he's in a sling supported prone, just drilling them in. Hmm. And uh, actually did you know pretty strong work. Uh, it, he went for the headshot, and he just he missed by about you know probably like four or five inches. Uh, threw a nice little group on the wall. Uh, anyway, I mean, that's I I knew it was 100 meters because that's literally where we did sprints in the morning. And that's uh, I have a 100 meter zero on my rifle, so I just dropped to a knee, uh, held on the notch of his neck, uh, fired one round, and vaporized him off the earth. Yeah. And you know I was I was pumped because I was like, <laughs> yeah, I'm a sniper, and I just shot a suicide vest and detonated it, and uh, if. It's that's bucket list stuff for for pretty much every sniper anywhere. And uh, so then you fix the next malfunction in your scar. Oh uh, no! no she, <laughs> she ran like a champ for the rest of the day. Just you that, probably did that it. one little stumbling block. You probably did impede the travel of the charging handle. Would be my guess. Yeah, because as soon as I locked the bolt to the rear and pulled the magazine out, I didn't even have to sweep. Yeah, everything had had a piece of brass in two rounds, and they just they yep. both fell out. Back up and running. Back right, right back up. Yep. Um. So. Anyway, I saw where the rest of them kind of ran off to my right. I didn't know what they were doing, and I I knew everybody was coming with me as soon as they got whatever they were doing undone. Um, I wasn't mad at them yet, but I was about to be. Uh, and then so, you know, I, I go to close with the rest of them or, or where they had went. They'd run off to my right, and I, my thing is I'll go get after them. If they try to maneuver, I'm going to I'm gonna make it difficult until the, the rest of the, the rest of my guys get with me and – Pull that mic a little closer to you. Oh, and um, or just pull it to yeah. you. It moves. There and uh, if they uh, if they try to come back down this lane, I'll stop them away from this corner and away from my guys, because uh, I can hear you know everybody screaming behind me. You know, medic, 
uh, I'm hit, Chief's hit, you're hit. How bad were the guys on the ATV hit? Uh, so the driver of the ATV got shot in the forehead at the lip of his helmet, uh, almost point blank, and it it stopped it. Uh, wow. Op, yeah, Ops Corps helmet. 762? Yeah, and it was brand new Chinese ammunition. I think Fuck. That, 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 it was an armor-piercing incendiary round. Uh, so I was pretty impressed because that should not have worked. <sighs> there might be some QC issues yeah. with that round. I mean, what you're <laughs> describing, that should have – there should have been basically Shoot. a lower jaw left. Right. Yeah. But we we have the helmet. We have the round still. Um, it just it hit there, and I think it either at the angle he was firing up, but it just it grabbed it and and stopped it. Um, Fuck. Back by uh, you know top of his head. Didn't do him any good though. He didn't, yeah. he didn't. He wasn't real sure about what was going on for the most of the day. Yeah, you're gonna get a concussion from that, and probably a little whiplash. Yeah. And then uh, they they shot him in the legs too, just to make sure that he stayed stayed put. Uh, and Chief Colbert, I thought he was grievously injured. I, you know, I linked back up with him later on the battlefield and, and was surprised to see him walking around. But uh, he just got shot through the butt, which apparently hurts. But you can through you can walk tops. it off. Yep, yep, yep. He's got a uh, he's got five assholes now. One God gave him four. The Taliban did. He got shot four times in the ass. Well, one bullet. You know, two cheeks. Okay. One, two, three, four. All right. Fair <laughs> enough. And it was you know it was a solid core armor piercing ammo. So. If you if you got to pick something to go through your body, I guess that's that's what you pick. I guess unless another option is yeah. not having that happen. Not having that, yeah. That's, yeah. that's not getting shot is also you know that's the that's the primary for sure. And uh, but anyway, when I when I when I stepped out of the truck with the pistol, uh, they were all shooting at me, missing me, and just hitting uh, Nate and Drew in the Toyota. So everybody in the truck got shot except for me, which they're they're very upset about still to this day. It's fair. Yeah, they, they said it's not fair. It's fair for you. Yeah, it's, it worked out really great for me. Yeah. Um, but anyway, you know, so I start closing the distance w- with uh, where where they went. You know, I kind of saw them out of my periphery, uh, ducking behind cover. I get about halfway down this little lane, um, and they start they hang muzzles and start engaging me again, and and uh, you know I start uh, firing back, and I'm I'm moving off to my right. I kind of see a, a generator junction panel, and I'm gonna uh, pull up behind it. I get about most of the way to it, and my rifle went dry. And uh, I know my pistol's only got like three rounds in it, so I'm like, I can't transition again. I got to reload this thing. So I go to reload, and I got you know got my big, you know, giant rifle, and and uh, as I pull my muzzle up to start that um, that reload drill, the nearest fighter to me just threw his rifle into the sling, and sprinted toward me, you know, screaming out Akbar, just like the movies. Fuck. And, uh, yeah, it got me excited. Yeah. Anyway, I, I did my speed reload and dropped the muzzle down and just just uh, started thumping away at him and uh, detonated his vest. Um, and, you know, it felt like he was hanging on the end of my muzzle, but, you know, he's probably from here to the door, which is That's still, still very, very close. close. Yeah. Didn't do me any good. <clears throat> so I don't know. I think it knocked me out, but, man, I was, I was definitely TKO'd, and I was kind of crumpled over on my side. And uh, I started hearing that snap thump and, and uh, that big aggregate gravel that they have on fobs, you know, like that four inch yeah. stuff. That stuff's like exploding up on my face. And I, I lo- remember looking up and seeing another another fighter has has left cover and he's just walking down on me, um, squeezing rounds off out of his rifle. But he's uh, he's not looking over his sights. He's just looking over the gun, holding it low. And so all of his rounds are landing, you know, like, you know, 10, 15 inches below my head. Mm-hmm. And uh, anyway, I jerked my my rifle up and just started thumping away at him and folded him up and uh, climb up back to my feet and start engaging the guys behind him. And my rifle went dry again. And uh, I decide I'm not going to do this uh, who's faster uh, thing again. So I, I dump my mag and I sprint back down to the corner. And as I'm re- I get reloaded. I send my bolt home and I kind of you know spin around that corner and I crash into Drew. Who was uh, in the back seat of the truck? He was trying to follow me when I jumped out, but just one of those freak freak of natures. Uh, a round hit my door, rode down the door, and then hit the child safety locks on the rear, so he couldn't open the rear doors on this uh, TRD. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which is you know, like what are the chances? Yeah, you can't make that shit up. No, 
and it was it's a little uh, it's a little wire switch that's painted red and it just had a it had that AK round just sitting on top of it and that lever was bent down. So anyway, we we remove those now. You never need uh, child safety uh, yeah. locks in the in your trucks in combat. But he was back there trying to fight out of that, and the back seat was full of mail. Uh, so he was bleeding all over the mail, and all you know, we got all the company's mail shot to pieces. Uh, didn't make us super popular. But anyway, he crashes into me, and I'm like, "Hey, Drew, I know right where they're at. Let's go get them." And uh, and Drew's running an MP5. <laughs> Why? Because uh, it's comfortable for walking around the fob. I you guess know, and yeah. shooting rodents. Yep. And uh, and his big thing is, you know, he's uh, he's just escorting guys. He's in the company headquarters too. Yeah, yeah, I get it. So, I'll, and he kept going to the front gate with just a pistol, and I was like, Drew, you can't, I don't like you going to the the gate with just your Glock, man. It's not so that much like, difference between a Glock and yeah. an MP5. But he had three mags, you know. I was like, what? Yeah. At least at least carry the MP5. And he, so he had he had just come back from one of his little gate runs. So he's got the MP5, and uh, he's like, all right, let's go. So we we come around that um, corner again. And we're walking down toward that, you know, doing cross coverage. Now we're, I'm, I'm fairly confident that we're going to get him. And uh, he's going over that last guy I shot, and that guy's he's smoking. And uh, <clears throat> um, yeah, that guy's sitting there, kind of just smoking, you know, like. And uh, and Drew's looking like he's going to step over him, and uh, so I look across. I'm like, Hey, Drew, don't don't go near the bodies. They're all wearing suicide vests, which kind of you know. Causes him to stop, and he looked over at me. And he's like, "What?" It's like yeah, they all have suicide vests on. Stay away from them. And uh, as we're kind of locking eyes on that, that that vest goes low order, and uh, you know, it's low order it doesn't explode. It just starts burning. But when high explosive burns, it's it's intense. Yeah. So it's it's like a 20, 30 foot blowtorch. And whether it was that guy's hand grenades or not, anyway, everything just started exploding all over the place. All the guys behind, that had that we're still alive to start chucking hand grenades back there. So Drew and I both end up behind this generator junction panel together. It's almost big enough for both of us, but not quite. And, uh, and we're trying to return fire as best we can. And, and, uh, which is difficult because literally everything's exploding. And, uh, you know, we're, we're getting after it and I, and I get hit in the throat by something. And I had my little admin pouch where I keep all my sniper notes. And, uh, I look down and there's a, there was a hand grenade trapped in between my uh, admin pouch and the generator panel, and it's it's the worst kind because there's no pin in it and it's not mine. Uh, so I you know I start just sweeping that thing away and got it off my chest. And uh, as I was messing with that, I felt something hit me in the back of the knee, and it was a another hand grenade. So when I was when I ducked my head and was messing with that one, they'd thrown another one. It hit the wall behind me and had ricocheted and luckily hit me in the back of the knee because I. I, I probably would not have noticed it. Um, and then, uh, you know, Drew and I both thought it was our job to kick hand grenades out, which frustrated the efforts because we're both kicking that grenade back and forth. Uh, That's a really shitty game of soccer. Yeah, especially when two people are ultra amped up. But yeah. we, we finally got it booted out of there. <clears throat> and uh, Drew grabbed me. He's like, hey, we got to get out of here. They're going to kill us. And he's a pretty smart guy. Uh, so he grabs me and yanks on me. And we, we both take off running, probably get a couple steps. And something blew up, hand grenade, vest, I don't know. But it, it blew us down, and I'm all tangled up on top of him. And we, you know, we fight back to our feet and uh, get around this corner. And uh, Chief Colbert's there. He comes walking up, and he's like, you know, what are you boys doing? Oh, and, just fucking off. Yeah. You know. <laughs> and I'm pumped, you know, because I, you know, I ran over and hugged him. I thought he was dead, you know. Yeah. So I'm, I was just super excited that he was uh, he was still in the fight. And we're like, Chief, we we know, we know right where they're at. Let's go get them. And he's like, "Well, let's go get them then." And uh, we had one Navy SEAL. He's he has shown up now to be a part of the story, Lieutenant Turdeseed. Uh, so we set set it up. Lieutenant Turdeseed and Drew are going to take that far left again. Me and Chief are going to take the right. Um, and uh, I'm like, "Well, I'm going to reload." So I start I start digging around my vest, and uh, I don't have any ammo. I've I've my vest is empty. I pull my mag out. And uh, there's only one round in my magazine, which sounds bad, but there's still one in the chamber, so I actually have twice as much ammo, so I got two rounds. Still not awesome, though. <laughs> no. <laughs> and uh, anyways, I like, Chief, I can't go first. I I only have one bullet. And, and he's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, I'm out of ammo. Like, 
I cannot go. I cannot go point. You have to go point, but uh, don't worry, I'll cover you. And he's like, oh, you just want me to get shot up more? And I was like, well, well it's been Unless working. You want to give me some ammo? Yeah. Well, he, you know, he had an M4, and I have this. Yeah. Uh, I'm the only compatible. person there with a sniper rifle. Um. Anyway, yeah. So he's like, fine, I'll take point. And uh, so we start moving, and uh, I hear like, hey, can I come with you guys? And I turn around, and it's a uh, a Polish soldier and a, uh, a sergeant from the 10th Mountain named Mike Aulis. And he's there, no kit, uh, just his rifle with his one magazine that he's been running around base on. And I was like, if you want to, but it's, <laughs> it's you pretty— You might need more than that. It's pretty bad down there. Yeah. But uh, he goes with us. We roll back down this little lane. And we get down there, and it's just, and not that it's calm, but there's not hand grenades deton every, detonating everywhere. Uh, you know, you can still hear stuff going around the camp, but it's pretty calm in this general vicinity. And there's just bodies everywhere, or not bodies. There's pieces of bodies everywhere. And uh, Chief Colbert, he's like, "Well, I think you boys got them all." And uh, you know, right when he says it, this dude sits up out of this, you know. Rib cage and pile of legs, and you know, bounce passes two hand grenades to us, screams out like bar and, and detonates his vest. And uh, and I remember everybody's running all over the place, and you know, one of these hand grenades comes bouncing, and uh, and I'm like, well, I'll just ride it out right here. Uh, <laughs> been, it's been working for me, yeah. And I'm just yeah, now I'm like, you know, we talk about like what I, I don't know why I was so confident that was going to work, but I see this hand grenade laying there, I was like, oh, I don't have eye pro on. I better not look at it. So I I just turned my head to the wall and waited for it to detonate, and it did, and it hurt, but you know I I didn't get you know severely injured. Good job not looking at it. Yep, I remember just saying, "I'm like what an idiot." <laughs> 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 but I was just so many hand grenades had detonated. I was like, "Though they don't hurt you." Oh, but uh, they do. But they do, yeah, because you know Drew, you know uh, he got hit everywhere. I only got hit like with my arm, just a little bit. But he was he got hit in the bottoms of the feet when we were running off. So he's got frag all over him. And then I still didn't really get uh hit nearly as much as he did. So he we don't really fully understand why. But uh now you know now I'm now I'm kinda of by myself because everybody has, you know, sought cover away from the hand grenades like you're supposed to. And uh I hear you know, I hear I hear uh, an AK from behind again. And uh I see Drew kind of tracking a target and he's spinning around to his left uh engaging with his mp5 and and i turn around and i see a there's a, a fighter has run all the way around this little block we're on and uh, attacked our little stack from the rear and uh you know i fired my last two rounds at him and um whether me and drew's rounds detonated his vest or whether he got hit and just cacked it off i don't know but it, he he pretty much um fell and detonated right at mike Allis's feet and uh, which blew him most of the distance to me. Uh, at this point, like I'm completely out of ammunition, um, and I was kind of like you know jumping around with my hands out trying to figure out what to do. And uh, so I, I figured, well, I'll be the I'll render aid. That's about the only useful thing I can do. So I, I ran over, um, grabbed Mike, and uh, started dragging him uh, into a a safer area but it was a uav compound yeah and it just wasn't out in the open and uh i get him back there and i'm still uh you know everybody's kind of getting sucked into other other problems the the base of fire is in a house just off the camp and there's still indirect fire landing but anyway nobody nobody came with me and i'm kind of alone again and I'm, I'm trying to treat mike but i still have this this big gate is open to me and i and i keep you know trying to spin around and 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 look behind me and i don't know if there there's anybody in this compound and Anyway, I see this civilian, and he's kind of hunched over behind this this uh, generator, and uh, I yell at him like, "Hey, can you run a rifle?" And he's like, "Yeah." So I I send my bolt home on an empty chamber, and I hand him my rifle, and I was you know, like, "Hey, posted him up in the in the doorway." This is for you, buddy. And I was like, "Cover me." <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I don't know who he was. If you're hearing this, sorry, but you know, yeah, my bad. I needed somebody to watch my back, and and I think you know the rifle calmed him down enough that. At least he was paying attention. So I started treating Mike, and and he, you know, it's it's bad. And uh, but we're on camp, you know. I'm like, I don't need to save his life. We're we can get him to a hospital in like a minute. So I, you know, grab the civilian, throw him in this uh, in this uh, uh, LTA TV, throw Mike in there, and and uh, I'm like, all right, you're gonna bum, you're gonna 
you know, push out the gate, I'll cover you. And he's not really digging it. Yeah. Because, you know, there's still two PKMs, and they're just basically shooting everything out there. Yeah. Uh, another soldier runs up, and he's like, what's going on here? And I'm like, I'm like, hey, get this guy out the gate. I'll cover you guys. You know, get, get this kid to the hospital. And uh, that helps them. You know, they go, and I stick my rifle out, and I'm looking left and right. I'm like, you know, waving my hand. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, you know, they got Mike to the hospital in, I think, like 90 seconds, 120 seconds after he was wounded, like really fast. But, uh, you know, he was he was just uh, it was just too much. And, and uh, he, he passed in the hospital there. That sucks. Yeah. But anyway, you know, so now I'm out there with just my pocket knife and and uh, man, I hate telling this part of the story because it validates part of the Q course I hate. But when you become a weapon sergeant, they have light weapons. And it's very annoying because they they just have like buckets of parts, and you're supposed to like build a gun. You recognize all these random pieces, and and they're you know on the battlefield as a green beret, you might come across a bucket of parts. You want to be able to build a gun and get back in the fight. Yeah, in your head in the Q course, you're like, come yeah, on, asshole. Yeah. And uh, so anyway, I run over and grab an AK, and it's got a 308 hole through the bolt, and uh, so it's ruined, and the in the op rod is snapped off of it. And I'm like, crap. I run over and grab another AK, and it's got 9 mil rounds uh, right through the top of the magazine, but it stretched the receiver all apart, so it's ruined. But the bolt's good, so I, like, strip the bolt out, run over to the other one with the bad bolt, and I put a rifle together. So you're just doing arts and crafts. Yeah, just and I get I get an AK put together, and I start, you know, grabbing mags, and, they, and I'm, there's grenades everywhere for the underbarrel launcher, so I just start winging grenades. Uh at this house off base and and uh anyway my my incoming commander you know came up and he's like hey what you doing <laughs> i was like hey good you're here sir let's go get these guys and he's like yeah i think the you know because the polish armor is pulling in at this point he's like they i think they got it let's go back to the camp and it's good they did that because i i didn't think grenades were dangerous probably not the safest battle buddy to take uh into a house assault yeah yeah how much total time has elapsed between vbid and where you're at right now in the story I, nine minutes okay yeah so i i thought back on it and i'm like oh, that was like a 45 minute gunfight and then we we watched a video and it's the raid camera you know spinning back and forth and uh, i was like i know when that happened i know when that happened it's like you can you know like pretty much the camp is the that part of the fight's over like nine minutes later so you guys go back to the green beret camp and then how's the rest of the day play out for you uh so i i you know i go and get um looked at because I have a, you know, I have a TBI issue. I, I'm starting to get a, a pretty crazy headache, and uh, I I remember getting a cup of coffee and I took my kit off and instantly just started getting crazy back spasms, uh, and uh, I got you know they gave me a bunch of Valium to calm it down. So I went and uh, slept all night. Everybody, all the walking wounded got put in towers and had to pull security all night. So Fuck. so everybody that was with me had to pull guard all night, and then I was just you know just racked, racked out. out on a, a a big nice volume ride which <laughs> they, fucking they're like to unbelievable the you know chief got shot through the through the butt so he can't even sit down so he's just hunched over a sandbag wall all night and he's like where's earl at and like oh he got narcs so he's a he's, he's sleeping he's sleeping <laughs> what <laughs> but uh so i i yeah I, I herniated uh like three or four discs in my in my uh back neck uh mid spine which uh is not great yeah but my my real only other injury was one of the vests detonated in a piece of um ak brass with an undented primer stuck in my arm huh. so i had just i had a i had a piece of brass with no powder or bullet on it and it was just stuck in my arm like corked you yeah i was actually i was trying to i pulled it out with uh my gerber myself but it was like the actual suction of it being stuck in my arm was the biggest problem huh. and it it like popped when it came out and now you can only see it if i get a su i get a sunburn you can see like a little crooked yeah little thing there so i'm assuming after this they were surging assets towards you guys additional security or no so we had you know we had a we had a, a battalion from the 10th mountain that was retrograding uh um, oh, you guys had plenty of guys then. we had tons of guys they were just the whole the whole battle they were <clears throat> in their bunkers where they were supposed to be um and the poles had uh they had another battalion they had a ton of tanks uh, so the the problem with them is 
the base, they have a very Soviet style uh, method of command and control. And the only person that could adjust the base defense plan was the uh, base general. And he didn't have a radio that worked to, to talk out. Okay. So we actually, several times during the battle, these Polish uh, armored vehicles uh, would, would whip past us and, and we'd try and get them to stop and come in, like, hey, come in here and shoot your main gun around a little bit. Uh, and they just wouldn't. They went to their prepared fighting positions and uh, and they were probably uh, distracted by all the fire coming from off the camp because they, they did go and, and handle that. Yeah, uh, and they the hotel. shot the shit out of those guys. So Good. Good for them. Yeah. So how much longer were you guys there on that deployment? Like uh, probably two months. And you just went back to business as usual after that? Well, so I was a mess. Uh, and uh, they, they nobody wanted to send me home, and I didn't want to go home. And, and it really set my recovery back kind of a lot. But the uh, they did a 15-6, uh, and they started you know doing an investigation for the Medal of Honor, and they didn't want to send me back. They, you know, they wanted me to be there to, to you know, be my own witness. And so I, 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 uh, I was on narcotics for, for most of the rest of that. So I didn't have a real job anymore. They found somebody else to, to run the day-to-day -day stuff. And I could barely get dressed. Um, I had a, a buddy of mine, um, Ben Rizika. He had to come in every morning and, and put my pants on and put my boots on. And Yeah, they should have sent you home. Yeah. You know, it was an emotional decision. Nobody wants to get sent home. And, you know, we're, we're so close, you know, we're – in, in six weeks, I think we started the the actual process of sending guys and yeah yeah. So they initially started the investigation and they were already talking about the Medal of Honor then because you were originally awarded a Silver Star. So I was Is originally right? awarded a Silver Star, um, but the yeah the original uh, investigation they did a distinguished, distinguished service cross with a recommended upgrade to the Medal of Honor. Yeah, and uh, why the fuck would that get downgraded? Uh, I don't know. So well, I do know a little bit out of it. They did several fifteen sixes. Um, and it was the narrative and the the original narrative was very um what's the right word just almost like a very professionally done AR and the uh 156 was done by one organization the 101st uh and and then the the stuff we were pushing came out of socom and I don't think that it really got all the way linked together, the full the full two pieces, mm -hmm. uh, until later. So how long after that uh, event were you awarded the Silver Star? Uh, about nine months, maybe a year. And then how long after that did you start hearing rumblings that it was going to so be upgraded? I, I continuously heard it, always. Really? Uh, yeah, so even, even after my Silver Star ceremony, they were like, hey, the command is re-engaging on this. Um, and then, you know, even three years later, there was a 15-6 on the downgrade, um, and they were going to send it to another board to get looked at again. And, and uh, you know, so I – and that's, you know, it's pretty – at that point, I'd be almost uh, – was kind of numb to the to the word Medal of Honor investigation. Yeah, for sure. Well, especially if it's getting kicked around. Yeah. So, yes, no, maybe <clears throat> so. Yes, yeah, no. So, you, so every – you know, every uh, – Eight nine months, I get a phone call from somebody that's like, "Hey, we're looking at your award for the Medal of Honor," and I'm like, oh, "Okay, cool." <laughs> you know, and like Forrest yeah. Gump, and it, like getting investigated for the Medal of Honor again. Yeah. Um, so I didn't really take it seriously. It was just this background thing, um, and it changed in, in in that they they called me and like, "Hey, we're we're looking at this um, upgrade," and they're being very. Uh, that's not shady. It's not the right. Not a lot of information. Where Obscure. before, uh, yeah, they're being they're you know talking in in uh, just around certain things, and I was like, well, that's different. But they why wanted, would they even? Why would they even talk around anything? I don't. I, don't get, I think it's they don't. So they're very because it changes so much and it's so impactful. Yeah. I think that they they uh, they don't want everybody knowing before it's time. Uh, for, okay, for that's any fair. reason, yeah. And uh, so anyway, but I knew something was up because they wanted to know exactly where I was. They wanted to know exactly what I was going to be doing and where I was going to be doing it and how I'm going to be doing it. And uh, like on a particular day? Well, we're not to the day part yet, but I was like, well, that's different. Yeah. And uh, so anyway, she's like, hey, you know, uh, hey, I need to be able to get a hold of you. It's probably going to be inside this month. So I need you to be reachable. So that means... Don't deploy. Uh, don't go to the field, 
And I'm like, yep, sure. I got that handled. Don't worry about it. And then, you know, I hung up on her and instantly deployed because this was the, the closing in the closing days of Afghanistan. Yeah. Uh, my team was supposed to go, uh, go in and, uh, we can't decide whether we're going in or coming out, but I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm not deploying. And I instantly hang up and, uh, See like, ya. Flew, yeah, flew out to, uh, <laughs> flew out to Kuwait to like start organizing yeah. uh, equipment and uh, a platform in case we do go into, uh, uh, Afghanistan. And, uh, Anyway, I get back from that, and they start calling me very a lot more frequently, and they're like pinpointing this day, and and they're like starting like two who months are, out. Who are you talking to at this point? Like what? It's who? a it's a liaison from from the Pentagon from okay. the H, uh, headquarter uh, uh, HQDA headquarters department of the Army. Okay, and uh, so now I'm kind of like mm, something significant is happening, and uh, but it's starting to get old. I'm like. They're like, hey, uh, a senior member of the U.S. government needs to get a hold of you, and they're going to call you at this day. And I'm like, and it's like in 30 days. And then they, it's like you fuckers yeah. have my cell phone, well, obviously. Like, and so. I'm like, I'm a Green Beret. I can run, uh, you know, unconventional warfare platforms behind enemy lines. I can answer this phone call, <laughs> which you know leads into the story. I'm getting, Let me train but, up for yeah. this. <laughs> so they're, you know, they're calling two weeks out. Hey, in two weeks, you know, a week out, and then you know, four days and 48 hours. This is going to happen. And then, and then finally, like, hey, in 24 hours, you're getting a call at this number at this time. And I'm like, gotcha. I will be ready. Yep. They call me the morning of, hey, and and you know, in six hours you're getting this phone call. Hey, in two hours it's going down. I'm like, okay. This is a lot of fucking <clears throat> phone calls yeah. leading up to a phone call. Right. And uh, so an hour before the phone call, my phone's charged. I go outside because I don't want them calling my team room phone and, and talking to uh, anybody in there or hearing anything that they got to say. Yeah. What's uh, up, dick face? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and I go out. I light a cigar. And I'm, you know, I'm gonna smoke this cigar until it's time. And there, the power goes out on base like 20 minutes before the time. <laughs> and the, it did something to the cell phone tower. Yeah. Because my signal went from full signal to none. And Fuck like, yeah. And I'm like, oh shit. <laughs> uh, so I, you know, I throw my cigar and I run to my truck and I start driving around base looking, looking for, for signal cell coverage. Yep. Yep. So I, I get over by the the Madigan Hospital. And I'm in the parking lot there, and I got like uh, two, sometimes three bars, but it's it's a phone call. This is going to work. And uh, the phone call comes in, and it says, White House, U.S. government, and it goes straight to voicemail. <laughs> didn't even <laughs> didn't even let me a- attempt to answer, and I'm just sitting there, you know, stunned. And I'm starting to like sweat down my back, and I'm just imagining yep. the cascade of disappointed looks. I am so fucked right yeah, now. Yeah, I'm just imagining like... What the? Have we been calling this guy to get yeah. this damn? And I'm just like, I wonder how long the kill chain is on this disappointed look to to leave wherever it's at and get all the way down here to first group. About three minutes. Uh, <laughs> but I'm like, well, you know, never say die. So I just call him back, and uh, it rings, and, and uh, there's an operator picks up, and he says, you know, White House. I was like, I, I just missed a call from this number. <laughs> And he's like, sir, I think you were, I think you were spoofed. I was like, well, I was expecting one though. Um, and he's like, okay, what's your name and affiliation? And I was like, you know, Mass Sergeant Plumley, U.S. Army. And he he goes, uh, you know, hold for the president. And uh, the president picked up on the second ring. So that's my claim to fame. He he didn't call me, I called him. Yeah. How was that conversation? It, it was it was super cool, man. He I think he talked to me for you know like you know twenty minutes. What did you chat about? Uh, well, he just, you know, he informed me that I, I was going to be receiving the Medal of Honor, and uh, he asked a lot of questions about my family, asked where, what our living situation is, and and uh, he asked me, he's like, hey, where are you at right now? And I was like, well, I'm actually parked in a parking lot in, in the rain, because I had to go get cell phone signal, and I made some other joke, and he, and he started, he was laughing, and he's like, hey, I don't want anybody to miss out on this, you're a pretty funny guy, uh... He's like, I want to put you on speakerphone. <clears throat> so, you know, he puts, hey, you're on speakerphone. I don't want to make it weird, though, so I'm going to introduce everybody in the room. And it was a Secretary of Defense, Secretary of the Army, and I think the Secretary of the Navy. Yeah. And I was like, well, that's. <laughs> that kills all the fun we're about yeah, to have. Like, I'll try my best to make funny jokes, but yeah. really, this is a lot of pressure right now. <laughs> uh, but, is he you know, at least better talking in person than he is in front of the teleprompter? Uh, no, he's, man, he, yeah, he can, he, can, he can run a conversation. And then, we, you know, we went to the White House. Uh, he instantly um, recalled the conversation from I think that was probably 
October, you know, two months prior. So you were awarded the medal about two months after. Yeah, the I think he called me in October, and then and then I, I I went to the White House in December. But yeah, he like the guy can talk and carry a conversation. I worry about him sometimes. I, you know, you know. So that's my uh, I know all the secrets now. Like the guy can talk. Um, his uh, he I think he's you know he just he can't see the teleprompter uh, very well. I hadn't actually thought about that. So that was when I get up there, you can see that like the teleprompter um, is. I mean, it's a. It would be hard for me, but I I don't do it habitually. And I, uh, my thing was he was just so awesome. And then we got up on stage, and and then he lost a little something when he when he got up on the on the podium. I just I think he can't see the teleprompter, man. Um, I hadn't thought about that. When he's not reading, because when he's not reading the teleprompter, he's like he's all over it. Cool. And I I was like, what the hell just happened? Because he went from being like the super engaging, you know, witty guy, and then he got up and was and like. You gave kind of a clunky speech, but I, you know, I went back for the an award um, a couple of weeks ago, and they they had a bigger, better teleprompter, and his his uh, speech for uh, Colonel Davis was like on point. So, I think good he, to hear. I think he just couldn't. I think his eyes sight changed, and he's kind of a busy guy, so he doesn't go in and get his prescription for contacts or glasses checked, or maybe the you know when they first set it up when he came into office, he could see, and you know a year or two later, it's just not working. Your eyes are not going to work well at the age of 130. Right. You know, it just is what it is. So, because I, I was like, <laughs> interpersonally, the guy's a rock star, man. Cool. Yeah. Glad yeah. to hear it, man. Yeah. Right. Yeah. He knows what he's doing. You might not agree with it, but he's he's yeah. doing it. Yeah. I don't have any judgment of that. I have zero actual uh, touch points with, <laughs> with the, the, with the man himself. So there you go. You're, yeah. the, you're the data point that I now have. You're the data point that you've told me about. I don't have it, but yeah. Yeah. And so then you do what? Go back to just you're like sweet. I am now just going to go back in the army, and I have a little bit of a blue flare piece. Yeah, I got a, I got a blue flare flare piece. <clears throat> uh, you know, I was a team sergeant at the time. Uh, we, we have all this stuff set up. You know, Afghanistan obviously didn't work out. Uh, we found other work, um, yeah. and uh, so we got out the door, and I got to finish my team time. I got to be a team sergeant until last October, and and then now I'm in the company headquarters. Uh, you know, doing headquarters things. Yeah, but. Like we kind of opened with, it's, there's light at the end of the tunnel, and you're seeing it. I'm honestly, I'm really glad I had a. Not that my work's not important. It's just not. It's not oper. It's not operational, and it's yeah. not a team. But it really helped me, uh, kind of, develop a personality other than Green Beret uh, operator Earl Plumley. Um, and it, and it, that work in that year in the headquarters that I've had so far has, has helped me kind of you know get ready for yeah. Um, not being in the army anymore. What kind of obligations come with the medal? I mean, I know it. I know it there's comes, a medal of honor <clears throat> society, but it. I don't know. It if comes any with of this not is... a single obligation. Really? I and that's the my biggest struggle as a as a recipient is n- I've had a commander's intent uh, to always operate off of, and now nobody tells me what to do. Hmm. Which is unsettling, but you know, I just I I find things. Uh, that I think have value, and that's why I pick recruiting and retention, um, and, and t- you know, tell guys my experience. Um, Are you going to be involved with the Medal of Honor Society? Yeah, I, so I, you know, I, I went to their first convention, and it was you know, I was a I was a fanboy of of recipients, uh, even as a kid. We had the coffee uh, book, coffee table book, and dude, that's a fucking powerful book. I I, I got that from my father one year for Christmas. That's a tough read, getting from front to back, man. right? And I just holy fuck. So we went in. I see all these guys walking around in there, and I'm like, I'm pointing them out. And I'm like, because I'm just, even though I'm there as a recipient, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just so enamored with these guys. And uh, that was I, I spent my first convention just you know skulking around, uh, trying to meet these guys because I think you always uh, you want to see what is different about this guy that makes him able to do these things. Yeah. Because you read these narratives, man. You're like, this guy must be this just super soldier that has this unique personality um they're the most common people i've ever met yep and i think that uh that's been my experience that they're just they're just good um soldiers obviously consummate think, warriors all of them i think it actually sets them up for failure in the long run if people do view them with that expectation yep. it can you imagine the fucking weight of that yeah I can. Yeah. <laughs> and everybody, you know, I'm not a philosopher. Everybody always wants uh, talking points from me that I'm like, I'm, that's not, you know, I'm, I'm not any different than when I, when I, yeah. when I got it. Talking before. point one, 
never take a scar into a place where an M4 <sighs> would work. Yeah. And always go with the three hundo. Yeah. <laughs> bring more bring more guns. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean it's be if you're gonna be a sniper and walk around with a sniper rifle, make sure your pistol work is on point. For yeah. sure. Take that note. Yeah. But and, yeah, everybody and always for the th- three people on earth that that's gonna help. <laughs> 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 yeah, every, you know, that's like, hey, we gotta talk about our pistols. Like the Glock's fine, we don't need a new pistol. You know, it's yeah. like, like, well, you know, you you've used your pistol. I'm like, I know, but I also, it's an anomaly. Like, yeah, yeah, you're one of two people that I know of that have ever actually transitioned to a sidearm and killed somebody with it. Right. The other one was Mike Day, who fuck, unfortunately, took his own life. I think it was last week. Yeah, saw that. Fuck, man. Yeah, I. How is the suicide rate in the Green Beret community? It's, uh, it's you know, it's if you compare us to the civilian world, it's we're better. But for, for highly competent, driven guys that are obviously going to be successful and are used to overcoming adversity, yeah. I would say it's probably high. Have you ever been able to figure out or connect any dots on the no, why of that? I cannot figure it out. And I just had a, I had a really good friend of mine um, – he was worked for me in the in the Marine Corps. Brought him over uh, with me after he finished his enlistment, and he came into the army with me. And he he, uh, he took his life, and we, we still don't know why. Uh, rock star, doing good, and his his career's doing fine. Yeah, doesn't have any disciplinary issues. Marriage is is getting it, and he, and uh, you know he killed himself. And uh, we, there is some research saying that a lot of these. Um, a lot of this brain damage, this TBI stuff, is is um, damaging the you know the, the frontal cortex and and yeah. causing this stuff. But you know that's that's not my thing. But there's something going on. Yeah. Because these guys literally on the battlefield would you know fight to the death. There there is no there's just no problem they won't solve, and then they get you know they get sad and kill themselves. And I'm like that's not that's not right. That's not the person that would do that. What percentage of the people that you know that have killed themselves when they did so, they were drunk? So two. I have two friends that I, I consider did that. But one was very drunk. One was very drunk. The other one, he was drinking, but not, you know, that not not excessively to the point where he wasn't understanding the ramifications of what he was doing. Yeah. There right. is a tie that I've seen, at least in the SEAL community, there's a... Not maybe not a direct tie, but it's corollary for sure. There's alcohol usage almost yeah. always, not always, but almost always around those incidents. Yeah, and, and uh, I don't know what it is, man. I don't either. I, and I wish they could figure it out. And I, I know afterwards when they're doing autopsies, they can see some of these the scarring and these. Yeah. And they can see it afterwards. I just wish we could figure it out before. Um, if they're able to figure it out, though, what if what if in their solution they say, "Hey, nobody should be able to do the job that you guys did"? Where does that leave us? I, th- I think that leaves us in an awkward place because um, honestly, the, the the job is assuming risk and uh, sacrificing. So I don't know if if I was told, "Hey, you know, sign this waiver," there's a really good chance that you're 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 going to be have tendencies toward suicide. I'm like, okay, you know. Like, this job also, you have a really good chance of not getting walking out with all your arms and legs. So let me just, yeah. I'll chalk up, up to things to be aware of. And grenades are dangerous. And grenades are dangerous. <laughs> Actually, uh, uh, you missed Le- that one. Leroy the Petrie's got the best. Uh, <laughs> they're like, if you could do anything different in your life, what would you do? And he's like, always grab grenades with your weak hand, not your strong hand. Because <laughs> he's I like, mean, I really wish I was dealing with, with uh, missing a left arm instead of a right arm. I think people should write that down. Yeah. So. <laughs> And grenades are dangerous, and if you have to grab one, use whatever arm you can do without for the rest of your life. But yeah. no, you know, if they had to tell, if they were going to tell me like, "Hey, there's a, a chance that you'll be suicidal," I'd be like, "Okay, I'm still going to do the job." There's I think a- I fall in that boat too. I don't think there's anything that could have been done to change the mind of 17 and a half year old Andy. No, I I'd be like, well, also, you know, 17 year old, like, oh. Ten percent of you are going to be killed, and you look around and you're like, "Well, I wonder who it's going to be." Yeah, <laughs> it's not me. I wonder which one of you bitches is actually that math applies yeah. to? Because obviously not me. But it would be nice to be like, of you three, you have, you don't drink alone, because you're you're the guy. Yeah, sucks, man. What uh, what brought you up to Kalispell? Because I know you were up here other than sitting down and having this conversation. So my mom owned 
a large piece of property in Oklahoma and had horses. And every time I went to visit her, I had to catch up on all the work. And as she got older, there was more and more work. And so I, I finally got her off of her property in Oklahoma. And the, the, the only thing I could trade her was cow spell. So she's, she lives here in town. Awesome. Yeah. And, uh, Made it, and now I don't have to drive to Oklahoma to see her. I can just drive uh, out here. So until you move to Florida, until I move to Florida. But you know, when it gets too hot in Florida, we'll come visit her in Kalispell. Should be should work out great. Yeah, no, that's awesome, man. I'm glad that you have the chance to do all that. I'm, I'm stoked that your mom lives here too. Yeah, she's she's loving it. Yeah, how long has she lived up here? Uh, I think this is her second year. Okay, so not long, but she's, yeah, she's digging it. I'll have to. Uh, and obviously, you have my number if she yeah. needs anything i'm more than happy to help unless you just want to commute from florida more often yeah well <laughs> mom's here so i gotta come at least once a year we gotta come up here yeah for sure so you're looking forward to being around for your kids being the cool dad what else fires you up about the next chapter of your life i you know I, i'm gonna find a job i just uh i'm gonna v- be very careful because i've i've had my dream job and i've had the job that i put my heart and soul into and I just want to find something that's as meaningful in that fashion. Um, and, I, and I just don't want to waste my time. You know, if I'm going to, if I'm going to go to work and not be in, in front of my family, I want, to, I want to find something that has some value and some meaning. Do you have any idea what that will look like for you? I don't have any idea what that will look like. My wife said I cannot be a firefighter or a policeman, though. So whatever it is, there has to be a better than average chance that you, you come home the way you left. So that's Okay. That's, <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, I think the beautiful thing is, is you're gonna have you're gonna have a lot of options. I'm gonna have options, and I'll you know I'll find something and yeah. latch onto it. And just see what it is. Um, I just remember the last time I tried to get out of the Marine Corps one time, and uh, I have a terrible guilty conscience. So I know that whatever it is, I think I'll always be trying to support uh, service members in a way or, or active duty guys in a way. Yeah. Um, and I just I don't know what that is yet, and I'll I'll figure it out. Yeah. I didn't know what the hell I was going to do. I, I thought I knew what I was going to yeah. do when I got out. I'm not doing it now. Uh, I never thought I would have been sitting down having conversations like this, you know, with a podcast or anything like that. But you have options. Yeah. I think I think you're going to be okay. Yeah, and that's all. This fine. You know, I, I had a, you know there was the uh, the contracting throughout the the GWAT was always huge, and you see guys would run off and you know go from making you know fifty sixty grand a year to making you know, two, three hundred thousand dollars a year. Yeah. And I've always been very careful because I had friends that ran over and I was like, I can't I'm gonna get out and come work with you. And they're like, don't do it. I was like, okay, says the guy in a brand new Corvette, why not? And uh he's like, I I'm compensated with money because uh I'm not he's like I'm not a he's like I'm not a soldier anymore. So I'm not honored. I'm not in a profession that people respect. He's like so he's like, I miss that. If I could, if I could come back in right now, I would. Hmm. He's like, so as long as you can still do that, he, that you know, all of them are making great money, and, and not a single one of them uh, thought it was a good idea for me to get out and go work with them. So I now, made some some pretty good mistakes. Yeah. with money in my life, thinking that money or a thing was going to provide happiness. Every single time, it has been the opposite of what I thought it was going to be. Yeah. Uh, yeah, my theory of getting out was. If you hang the spurs up, hang the fucking spurs up. That is that is a uh, great advice. Yeah, if you're if you're not going to be all the way in, be all the way out. Because yeah. I see guys get caught in the netherworld, and the nineteenth and twentieth group. That's our reserve. I see those guys. They got off active duty, but then they get in the reserves and they volunteer for every deployment. I'm like, what? You got out to for personal time, and you're going to go yeah. you know go to law school or something. But you're in Africa. Uh, they can't let it go. Yeah, I was like, you should have stayed on active duty. What are you doing? Yeah, they can't let it go. No, because it's a, it's an a it's an alluring profession, man. Like, uh, we have a really good poem about it that that's that kind of or saying, and uh, special forces is a mistress, and uh, anyway, she'll she leads you on this this great grand adventure, and uh, in the end, though, she leaves you for a younger man. Every time. Every time. Yeah. Every fucking time. Like we're dinosaurs yeah. in the world that we came from. That's yeah, you know, I you know, they're like, Oh, you're you're still young. I'm like, Yeah, outside of the army I'm young. Inside yeah. the army, they're like, Wow, you were in before nine <laughs> eleven? Yeah. Holy crap. There was a world before nine eleven. I was like, My first rifle didn't have rails or a red yeah. dot. They're like, 
what did you do? How did you use it? <laughs> like, well, I didn't. There was no wire. I just carried it around. But yeah, for sure. Well, dude, I'm gonna get you back to your mom. What do you want to close it out with? No, I think I just you know I've always uh, found value in my service and you know happy to be on the show, man. Yeah, thank you for taking the time. You I'm bet. glad that we can combine the two and we finally were able to link up, man. Awesome. That's awesome. Thank you.